Hello everyone, I'm Dan McDermott. This is Google Plus Week, an unofficial look at the world's coolest social network. For the folks watching on YouTube Live, Google Plus, and Justin TV, we'll do our best to monitor the questions and comments throughout the show, and we'll try to get as many of those on the air as possible. All of this week, many of us have been playing with the new Google Drive. Lots of news stories are treating this basically as another Dropbox, but with more space for less money. We think that that doesn't begin to tell the whole story. All of the talk about Drive has put some of the other stories on the back burner this past week, like a new Share on Google Plus button you can put on your website. We're now seeing a mad dash to adopt Google Plus Hangouts. What started as a simple video chat system for friends has morphed into a must-have resource for everyone from the Dalai Lama to Face the Nation's Bob Schieffer to the top NFL draft picks. Some folks you might not expect to be using the latest cutting-edge technology. The Detroit News is reporting that Google uh, is in talks with automakers about self-driving cars. There was some news from that other social network this week, including updates for user statistics, including how many photos are regularly uploaded and average comments and like rates. And apparently Zuckerberg and company are about to adopt a trending stories feature, much like Google Plus's famous and controversial What's Hot Posts. Oleg and Priz will duke it out over whether Google is more civil. But first, our featured guest. This week, it was up to my co-hosts, Alan and Oleg, to choose our first topic. And for reasons unbeknownst to me, they chose me. I have no idea what they want to ask me, but I imagine I'm in for something in between a grilling and a roast. First, the panel. Uh, from New York, we have Mr. Alan Furstenberg. Welcome, sir. Good evening, Dan. And uh, from Navajo Reservation, I can't remember what state. It's Idaho, right? Idaho. Idaho. We have Idaho. Harold Carey Jr. From um, San Francisco Bay Area, we have Mr. Jeff Zay Zayas. Zayas. Very good. Zayas. See? Uh, we have uh, Pam Alger, who is uh, off cam at, at the moment. And we have uh, Mr. Sreek Menon, who is in New Jersey. Sreek, welcome. <laughs> and, uh, of course, from Kirkland, Washington, we have the ever-charming Oleg Moskalensky, who is apparently going to begin the interrogation. Um, Oleg, I know you have some questions for me. I imagine this will be something like uh, Prime Minister question time toward the latter part of Maggie Thatcher's uh, term. Um, Oleg, uh, what is on your mind, sir? Hi. No, no, it wasn't anything like that. There's not going to be any kind of grilling or anything. Uh, if you were a president of the United States, that would be different. But no, what, what I was thought would be interesting for the uh, folks that watch us every week is to get some background on you being the gentleman that started the show and who orchestrates it every single week. And just to get some background, I know you have a fascinating um, history, basically, in terms of uh, who your dad used to be. Um, you know, we're not going to talk about anything classified, obviously, but in terms of your kind of upbringing and the places you've been to. So I just wanted to ask if you can maybe give a little history or whatever you can say about um, how you got to be to the point you, you are now. Um, well, wow. Um, I am what happens to ADHD kids. Um, I, I was born in Japan. My uh, dad worked for the U.S. Foreign Service. It was a diplomat. And I lived all over in war-torn countries and in nice countries that were peaceful. And I came to the United States in the ninth grade full time. Before that, it was Chris. It was like homely for a couple weeks a year or something like that. Um, and then I got into the news business. I was always interested in news. Uh, kids in high school in the, in the ninth grade, I had a subscription. I was at a boarding school. I went to Fort Union Military Academy and I had a subscription to the Wall Street Journal. Um, and the kids picked on me uh, for that. They thought that was odd. So um, I uh, really got into news, and I always wanted to have a newspaper. And I started out in radio news in the 80s. I worked first at an ABC affiliate um, during the, the prime of the ABC Information Network when you had Paul Harvey and you had uh, Joe Templeton doing the news. And um, I got to open the news with that, you know, da, 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 da. You know, I'm Dan McDermott, WLVA News. And um, at one of my were posts... The, were you the one that made that noise? Da, 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 da. That, was, that was your job? Yes, yes. Um, like Les Nesman on WKRP. But so I have actually have a recording of me as about, about a 19-year-old uh, on one of my posts, and I'll try to link to it in the comments under here. When I was doing the news uh, in the eight, late 80s and... 
Um, it was the day before ESPN was founded um, or CNBC. I said, that, and tomorrow uh, NBC is introducing the new Consumer News and Business Channel, which promises to provide 24-hour news about business or whatever I said. But it's interesting to hear that uh, now, you know, so many years later. And um, so I always had the bug. And then I went to a, I think, it, I don't know if it was NBC or CB, I think it was NBC affiliate after that. And then um, I was a teacher for a while. And, and um, now you know why I need a teleprompter, because I say and and um all the time. I can read a script like nobody's business, but I'm not good at off the cuff. So remarks. you're going too fast, though. Let's go back a little bit when you were growing up. So which countries did you live in? I lived in uh, Okinawa, Japan first. Then I went to um, India, I think, or Pakistan. It, it was, uh, we were in um, New Delhi in India, and then Islamabad, and then, oh gosh, uh, we were in... Dhaka, which is now in in Bangladesh, but at the time we were evacu we were evacuated because the the war was heating up that uh, between I guess East and West Pakistan and, and it be became Bangladesh, and so we were evacuated to Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, my dad stayed behind, and I think our house was either I've got to check on this. I think it was burned or blown up or something about a week or two after we left. And it was a nice house. We had um, my, my sisters were young and they used to get in trouble with the guards because we always had guards and they would uh, put they would sneak in the guard shack when the guards were out somewhere and they would turn it into a doll or playhouse and they put little curtains up and stuff and the guards would come back and be angry. And my dad got a pony. Um, it was really cool. And then it, it just um, uh, we, we had to leave suddenly when the war heated up. And so uh, I forget what happened to the house, but it was bad. And then we went to, I'm not sure what the order is because I was little, right? We went to Brussels, Belgium, where the weather was awful. We went to uh, Athens, Greece, which was wonderful, very hot. Uh, India was hot, like 110 degrees, 120 degrees. And uh, Greece, I loved. The food was wonderful. The people were wonderful. We went to London, England. I lived on Abbey Road literally right next door to where the Beatles recorded at EMI Studios. And I have a post. If you Google Dan McDermott, Abbey Road, uh, you'll find uh, the post from one of, one of my old websites where I have a photograph of our building. And you can see my the bedroom window on the flat in the building was directly overlooking the courtyard at EMI Studios. And I remember the, the, the newspaper salesman said he used to sell newspapers and cigarettes to the Beatles when they were recording. He sold the Weekly Standard just up the road. And every day I would go to the Northwest 8 tube station, St. John's Wood tube station, and I would walk right outside of my house was the, uh, the famous crosswalk where the Abbey Road album, uh, hmm. it's called a zebra crossing. And because there's, it's funny, in those crossings there's so many Americans, um, tourists, of course, they drive on the other side of the road, and we think to look left, right? So in England, at, or in London, in the tourist centers, they always have look right in giant letters, like two-foot-tall letters, warning you so you don't look left and get killed because uh, they drive on the opposite side of the road. Yeah. So um, little things like that, wonderful time there. And I met, uh, uh, I guess, my only friend who was a, house, a real famous musician, was Dave Ball, who was the keyboardist for Soft Cell. They had had a, that song, Tainted Love, which was a huge yeah. worldwide hit. I yeah. think at the time it was the, on the charts, the Billboard charts longer than any other song um, had been. And uh, we met at an Indian Is restaurant. There any truth to the rumor? Is there any truth to the rumor that in that famous shot on Abbey Road, that the guy in the Volkswagen there on the left was actually you? Or is that just a rumor? It's probably, it's probably a rumor, I'm thinking. Okay. This but morning. um yeah so how was it so ahead, you're saying you can neither confirm nor deny right that how was that it you're you Volkswagen? jumping all these uh you know countries all the time how how did you feel about doing it you know to deal with friends and everything I mean, what were your feelings about jumping all over the place like this that's the hardest part it's very exciting um to have seen the world you know i've lived in in another country liberia under a military dictator and he would drive in front of my house at least once a week with his motorcade and the Mercedes and the police. Um, everyone had guns. Uh, I was in danger a few times. One time a cab driver tried to steal me or I don't know if he wanted to eat me or whatever. Um, literally, uh, because if, if you look at like the, the, the vice guide to Liberia, you'll find that. 
But the, the hard part, oh, it, it was exciting because I got to see the world. I saw starving people, people getting killed in front of me. Um, and it's odd that you get used to that as a child, if, if that's what you grow up, mm -hmm. um, grow, grow up in. But we always had security and stuff, so we were relatively safe. But once in a while, I would sneak off like a, any teenager or, or pre, you know, tween, uh, tween would do. Um, and I, you know, sometimes we get in trouble, but the, the hard part was the friendships. I do not have any friends except period, except you guys, but I don't have any friends from before, um, my late teens, early twenties that I correspond with all of those kids. I don't have a hometown. Uh, I'm an import here. You know, I came here in yeah. 1990, I think, or 90, yeah, 90 in the front Royal. And I like it. It's my adopted hometown. But that's the price you pay. Every two years, you have, as a child, it's very difficult. You have to say goodbye to every teacher, every friend, um, you know, the staff, everybody. And, and that's hard. I mean, like I had a nanny. And so I had to say goodbye to her after. I mean, when you're a little kid, it's traumatic. So, mm -hmm. but I mean, that, that's, that's life. And there are all sorts of crazy, I mean, Americans, as you know, Oleg, because you, you grew up in, in the Soviet Union. You know how lucky and privileged we are, and that's why you're such a strong patriot here in the United States um, and pretty conservative because you've seen how the other part of the world lives. Right. Um, so it's it's a very different perspective that we who have had um, the luxury and the curse of having lived overseas to these different things, not curse, but the, the, yeah, the bad parts. Yeah, I'm so saying. But okay, you so then you, you moved to the United States when you were in ninth grade, you said, right? Yes. Ninth grade or you were nine years old? Ninth, ninth grade. grade. For high school, because I was in uh -huh. Africa. By that time, you already, you know, of an age you probably can remember fairly well, I assume. So how was it the transition to the to, you know, getting into the United States, literally almost like for the first time? Well, for the first time in your life, I guess, right? Um, they made fun of me um, because I was like a, a rich kid or whatever you want to call it, and and they not not rich, but to them uh, it was like um, my nickname was Rags because they joked that I went from riches to rags because it was a military school. And um, every ninth grade is traumatic for every kid in certain ways, but it's also it was exciting and fun. And but it the was whole a good experience. of you coming to the States, that's what I'm wondering. How was it for you to come to the States? Because have you been to the States before then or not at all? Hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, we would come every year for a couple weeks, and then in between tours we would get about three or four weeks, I think. It was so it's not, it wasn't a totally brand new experience for you by that No, time. and when you come yeah. back, the things you miss are McDonald's, um, color uh, cartoons, mm -hmm. Saturday morning cartoons, weird things that you take for mm -hmm. granted over there. But now, of See. course, McDonald's is everywhere. But over there, it was either, you know, just local stuff, you know, horse meat in Belgium or, you know, GB Quick yeah. or Europa, you know, d different things. Um, did, you did you come back with any kind of accent or st strange colloquial terms or something that was had hard for you to adjust? Um, I have, uh, I, I don't know what my accent is now. I, I, I can sound a little country when I'm with those folks, but in general, I don't think I have much of an accent. I think I have like a, I don't know what, I don't know. You guys tell me what, what do I sound like? What state you, or you do, you have a high Southern accent. You, you can hear the Southern lilt in your voice, which is characteristic of that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When, well, when... for 22 years I've been, or since 90, yeah, 22 years I've been here. So it rubs off, but. I could easily uh, slip. It depends what country I'm in. I can easily adopt the local dialect and idiomatic nuances and things like that because I've lived all over the world. I also rarely get sick because I've had about a thousand shots for wow. everything. Um, you know, I came back. I've had worms. I had three different kinds of worms in okay, India. Okay, okay. Let's not all get kinds of stuff. I have pictures. So, when you when you got when you got since you were coming to the states and you knew what the states were like. How was it for you to go back to these countries afterwards? Did you dread the concept or, I mean, I realized you didn't have much choice, but. I enjoyed it because it was always a new adventure and being, you know, attention deficit disorder, I'm always looking for something new. So I, was, I would always be excited going to a new country. And again, I was brought up that way. So I thought that was the norm. I didn't realize that was strange. Did you consider yourself privileged? I'm sorry. No, no. So, so it seems like you've decided to settle in the U.S. Why did you decide to settle here and not uh, become an expat somewhere? Well, I'm an American. Uh, my dad was a U.S. Foreign Service officer, just like a soldier's kid. You know, you travel around, then he comes back stateside. Um, and so 
you know, this is my culture because I would, I mean, we live like in some cases we would live on an embassy. If it was a dangerous area, um, we would live on an embassy compound or if uh, like in India, we lived in a gated, guarded embassy compound with other Americans. So we didn't have a whole lot of cultural experience. I went with other Americans to the American school set up by the embassy. Mm -hmm. And then um, in Liberia, we lived, uh, it was, we basically uh, spent a lot of money there with the local government. So they were pretty friendly to us. Um, have so you ever been in safe. really tough situations in terms of, uh, you know, I realize you said that they blew up your house, you know, a little bit after you left, but actually being somewhere in a dangerous situation at all? In any of those yes. Um, one time I saw uh, there was a mob. It, it was that I remember it was in Liberia. Uh, younger times, I, I don't know. But when I was a young teenager, like eighth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, um, one time there was a mob that was beating a guy to death in Monrovia, Liberia, or somewhere near there. And I happened to be in a, uh, going to a shop or something, and I looked over and I saw this giant crowd, and there was this guy with a big stick, and he was killing somebody. And so that kind of freaks you out. Um, and then another time, the cab driver grabbed me, or, or I was in a cab going somewhere, and we had stopped in traffic, and it was kind of in a big, busy market, and some person grabbed, I was an eighth grader, and he grabbed my arm real tight and was trying to pull me out of the cab. Uh, I don't know if he was trying to kill me or rob me or kidnap me or whatever. Um, but the cab driver, I hadn't paid the cab driver yet, and he wouldn't let him have me. Have me. So um, here I am today. Excellent. Wow. So then, then you said you got into, you know, fast forwarding a little bit, got into, you know, broadcasting on different TV channels stuff. Why newspapers? I and mean, why did you switch as opposed to be sticking with the, you know, vi visual broadcasting? Because um, I like this, but I've always been in love with newspapers. Um, I know that when the local, I mean, look at look at your local, uh, like what, what's the, I guess the Seattle Post Intelligence or is that what, what's yeah. your big newspaper? Seattle Times and Seattle Post Intelligence. There's two major newspapers: Seattle Times and Seattle Post Intelligence. Okay, when there's a a, a controversy on city council or state government or whatever the 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 newspaper will write the big in-depth breaking thing with the analysis by some seasoned reporter who's been doing it for 30 years covering the capitol or covering right. city hall then the tv station will do 30 seconds on it and a lot of people will pay a lot of people who are not really interested in news particularly will learn about the story that way um and then the radio station will usually except your big stations like your network you know your big stations they'll basically have an agreement with the newspaper where they read everything and they give them some ads or something uh, or they just mention it they aggregate well, we but all we know that when the newspaper does ads. it it's a it's the bigger deal it has a bigger impact so that's mm -hmm. why I was always in love with and I was just fascinated um, I remember from a business side I remember in, in one of the books that John Grisham wrote it was a story about a guy, a young guy who uh, ended up owning a newspaper, and there was a great line in there. He said, uh, "Small town newspapers don't print newspapers; they print money uh, because how profitable it can be." And so I always, that, but then of course the industry has changed dramatically since I read that line when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I just always loved it. I love the thought of of a physical product that's in your hand. Um, and it's just so are you are you actually a journalist then or are you just basically publishing newspapers but having your own people in the reporting i started out i mean a journalist is you know someone who documents things um and uh yeah i'm a journalist but i don't i don't write as much as i used to i write occasionally i still occasionally will write for huffington post um for my newspapers i'll edit a lot of stuff i will make uh editorial decisions uh, if we have a controversial story, I'll look at it and I'll sometimes I'll tweak it. But that's behind the scenes stuff that the readers well, when don't you started, know. When you started in the business originally, did you write, do all the, you know, it's, when did you, where did you come up with the content? Oh, I had um, the local newspaper, the weekly, fired their star reporter. And I hired him about an hour later. And I said, I'm going to start a newspaper. I want you to work for me. Because I've been thinking about it for a long time. And, uh, but I, that was the problem. How do I get the content? And mm -hmm. so uh, he was available, and um, you know, so bam, we. Uh, the rest um, is history. The rest is yeah. history. It's, I, now it's the number one paper in the county, and I have no newspaper experience prior to owning one. So isn't that crazy? 
Let, let me just take this opportunity, Dan, to say we've gotten uh, a few comments on YouTube, and uh, they're all very complimentary. They're finding you very interesting. Thank you. And uh, they wanted to thank us for this. Um, but they're a little concerned because for some reason YouTube has decided not to switch to your image at any point in time. So uh, they've been watching some great pictures of Oleg, but not you. So uh, they, they request that if you can, why don't you click on yourself to make sure you stay in the screen the whole time. Yeah. So uh, I will question. do that. I did that because I'm, I forgot. I, I apologize, but I, uh, I'm back now. Sorry. No problem. They, 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 it's an unmistakable whose accent is on, so they, they shouldn't be able to confuse pictures with the speech. Uh, next question, then, because you are pretty savvy in, ter in terms of computers and definitely a very avid and active user on Google Plus and everything else, you understand the digital realm of uh, publishing. And at the same time, you're very knowledgeable about the physical realm of publishing. publishing. How, Actually, be before you get into that, Oleg, yeah. can I ask Dan, along the same lines, um, how did you get into technology? What's your, your background in technology? Because, you know, uh, you've talked in the past about how you've uh, been a programmer at, at one point in your ancient past. We know you uh, you like to tinker with gadgets. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, your history with technology and, you know, growing up, early adulthood, how it moved on? When I was at Fork Union Military Academy in the ninth grade, um, there was, we're talking 83, maybe the 10th grade, I think I've, one of those years, 83, 84, there was uh, Fort Kenny Military Academy bought these laptop computers. And they were, it was a Timex Sinclair computer. Yes. It had a little line of text. You could program it. And I just was fascinated by this. Loved it. It was my first uh, experience with a computer other than playing Pong, which I still dominate at. Um, so then I, I just was like, this is so awesome. And I've always been a math guy. I was always really, um, I remember in Algebra 2, I got 100, and the teacher came to me and said he had taught for 35 years, and I was the first student to ever get 100. Then I ran out of math courses to take, and I had my senior year, because I, I went real quick, I had to take statistics because there was no more math um, to take. And then uh, I think I took calculus in the 10th grade or something. It was, it was, so I really loved it. And then the programming thing is the same side of your brain. It's logical. English uh, diagramming a sentence is, is, I can do it 17 levels down, perfect. But the English literature, I didn't enjoy because that's the other side of the brain. So um, I uh, programmed for the football players that were trying. I, I created a, a little pop quiz type thing where I, I actually coded a little program that would ask a question and let them choose an answer. Um, and this is in the ninth grade on an archaic machine, not unlike what Bill Gates was on. And uh, it was very popular with the football players. So that was my first foray. And then I got into, uh, got my first real computer later. It was a, a 286 with an amber monitor. Um, and I loved it. It had GeoWorks on it. And I just loved it, loved it. And then I wrote, um, I was on a billboard. I was on a then I got into the, the, the game I wrote, which was called Towers of Kublai Khan. It was published by MVP Software in 93 or 94. I ended up getting licensed or sold, I think, over 110,000 copies. And um, that's when I had a brand new BMW. Uh, but that was fun money and stupid. Um, that was the old, olden days. But uh, so I... Uh, it all started because I was playing this game. There was a magazine called Board Watch, which was a bulletin board system focused game. And it was pre-internet days, at least wide scale adoption of internet. And so I, I, um, I would go on to the, the Board Watch magazine, BBS, and play this Towers of Hanoi game. And um, it was so much fun, but I think you had to earn credits to play it for so much time or whatever. And then uh, I just mastered it, and I, I was like, and I had the highest score on, on the whole, all the users. It was a very popular BBS. So I was like, wow, this is really awesome. And so I decided to write it myself, mainly so I could play it on my local computer. And I was, uh, at the time, the, uh, the Pascal and BASIC, I was the advanced computer programming teacher. Um, I was actually, it was funny, because I didn't have a degree, and there were two other teachers who did have degrees, and they had me teaching the advanced, and they were teaching the intro and the, and the beginner level because I, had, I was good at it. So I was the only teacher in the school who didn't have a degree. And then the, uh, the evaluators came one year, and they shipped me off for a year 
and then brought me back the next year. Um, so that was wild. And that, that year I worked at Dell Tech as a programmer with Fox Pro. So that's kind of, I just love it. I love technology. I don't program now because basically I don't know what language to do database stuff in and, and I'm so busy. But I love it. Just like I love writing, but because I'm a newspaper publisher and I have all this other stuff to do, um, and frankly because I spend so much time like you guys do here addicted to this wonderful social network, um, I don't have the time to do what I actually wanted to do, when I st which is the reason I started it. If that answers your question at yeah, all. It does. But then going back to my question is, like I said, since you are pretty savvy in both the, uh, the digital realm and the you know physical publishing printing, how do you? What's your personal take on where things are going? Because you mentioned before uh, that you know even though newspapers are a dying breed in many ways, in your case, that's not the case at all. You're you're thriving and planning to open to do more newspapers. So how do you see this whole digital versus printing? situation evolving going forward obvious the, the the problem is we have warren county report is um very successful newspaper we often run out of copies um the problem is you don't make enough money online and that's why so many of these things are folding they'll start these online news sites and they end up folding but if you know how to do a newspaper and you know how to sell the ads we um are actually ran out of our our la last issue. They were really mad at me, the editorial, the the editor, um, because by the time we stuck the ads in, our which we the, what's left after the ads and the cover, and the you got to put the crossword and the Sudoku puzzle and a couple comic strips that are popular. What's left is called the news hole. In most newspapers, um, a healthy ratio is 50-50, but most newspapers don't do that well. They'll have fewer ads than 50%. In our case, we were 65%, and we had a news hole of 35% for the first time. So it was crazy. Um, and then the other uh, Frederick County report, we had to just add four or eight pages to it because we're selling so many ads. So the, we've gotten pretty good at how to do it. Um, but you have to address the, the digital. People want stuff. You know, I just put the whole player out there. The problem is I don't want... If you're the New York Times, you can hire someone to make a great BlackBerry app and an iPhone, iOS app, and and um, you know something snazzier for the Retina display and Android app and all that stuff. But if you're a newspaper that you know has thirty thousand, like Warren County Report has twenty thousand readers, I can't afford. Um, there's not enough revenue there to spend all that money developing those things. So what do you do? Um, most newspapers break their content out with a separate website and apps and everything, and then try to sell ads, banner ads, and you know so much per thousand ads but I can you know I would make in one newspaper what it would take me 10 years to make online um, literally the, the, it's that big a difference so I just um, I take the whole paper and I put it up in and I, I just put it on my profile the, the la latest one I put it in an issue ISSUU which I, I, I discovered because Google uses it for one of their publications and then we also put it in scribd and basically if Oleg's IT service, if you buy an ad on page six of my print newspaper, then you're also on page six online because the only way you can get the content is to read the whole publication in a reader. And mm -hmm. so most people just get it because it's a free paper. We put it all over. It's everywhere. It's by far the number one paper in the county. Um, and the Frederick County Report is the number two paper, far behind the number one paper, but growing rapidly. And we're adding pages. So while other papers are shutting down or being sold. We are hiring new sales. We uh, just hired two new salespeople, and we're printing more pages because we have too many ads. So, so, how, so come the, how, come the Times, how come the New York Times is, is going out of business with their circulation and stuff, and, and you're becoming successful with it? Yeah, that, They're that trying to question. go to online. That was my question. That was, that's what I was driving. Uh, well, the difference is they are a world and national publication. Um, they're having issues with the print because much of what you read was also on Drudge Report. And because people, I mean, why are you going to buy the paper if um, a reporter tweets the story and then you click in an incognito window so it doesn't rack up your X number of views that month um, and, and you can read it for free? Why are you going to buy the print product? I don't do that. I don't create a semi or slightly, if at all, profitable website 
uh, that that competes with with my print product. Now, now Dan, Dan yeah. just just to clarify, your print product is free, correct? Right. Yes, the print product is free. But but you serve you service a local market. I mean, it's all people want it because local news is local. It you know basically local politics, local local news, and you're the only game in town in for that, correct? No, there's a local TV station, um, and there's uh, a weekly newspaper and a daily newspaper. And uh, the Washington Post comes in here and the Winchester Star. But locally, there's several competitors, and we dominate all of them. We're more than twice all of them combined. Um, wow. So we're by far the number one source. But uh, the thing is this. Look at the numbers. The, the, the New York Times has millions of readers. Um, they might get 50,000 on a hot story or 100,000 or, or a million. I don't know. My newspaper, how many people care about the front row of town council? If I put a story, a hot story, I think our number one story ever got, I don't know, six or 10,000 views, right? That's nothing. Um, what's your average, what do you get per thousand views um, on, uh, you know, when you're selling ads? What, five bucks, maybe? So, probably less than that. Mm -hmm. okay, so let's say you have a thousand on a hot story, you get five dollars. You yeah. pay the reporter 50 or 100 bucks to write the story. Do the math, right? So, it doesn't work out on a local level. That's so why, why, you, why don't you think that they adapt your model then, in terms of well, you know, if, if that's the thing that actually makes it successful? That, that's, I guess, that would be my question. Why don't they do that since you have the formula that seems to work? I don't know. I think, uh, Everyone else is got to be online. The other newspapers online, and look at all the comments they're getting on their stories. Somebody called me up, a very prominent member of the local community, a rich guy, and um, he said, uh, "Look at the the other papers got 60 comments on this hot story. You got to get online and do it." And I was like, "What are they making from it? You know, 10 bucks, and they paid the reporter 50. You know, so and, and everyone who's reading it there is not going to buy the newspaper." And they're screwing over the 50 advertisers they have in the print okay, paper. Okay, now, now we're getting, we're going to start losing users, I mean, viewers with this kind of commentary. So I'll make the point Dan is not making. It's all because of Dan knowing what to do and clearly New York Times not knowing. That's basically the reason for the success. So moving well, then, on. Then let's take I, it I the would next have to step. disagree and, with yeah, yeah. the second well, part. Let's take it the next step, Dan, then, and ask Dan, why is it that you started getting into video broadcasting? Because even... Even before the, the Hangout feature came on, you had started setting up a, a nightly Just, or weekly show. Can you tell us a little bit about the McDermott Report? Um, I always wanted to do a... I like broadcasting. Once you do it at a radio station, and it's like ABC News comes on, and then at 5 after, you know, I'm Dan McDermott. It's 48 degrees in beautiful uh, Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, you're listening to WLVA, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's so much fun. And people are listening, and, then, and it's just cool. And so I liked it. But then when I got, wanted to get back into it, and I've experimented with different audio and video stuff, I just think it's fun. I like doing it. I like the interaction you get. Um, we're getting, you know, lots of comments. People are watching, and people are arguing back and forth about what we say, and that's just cool, you know. I think we contribute something. I think this show is the best hangout show period on Google Plus. And I think it's because we have an intelligent level of, of discourse similar to what you would find on a you know a big station or network. And I think um, we, I try to set a tone that uh, we want a professional type of dialogue and I think it contributes. So it's just so much fun. And um, it's also I'd, I'm getting ready to do some local stuff. I may do a local election coverage and I may start doing local stuff. I'm trying to learn how to do this, you know, because um, I've never worked at a TV station. I've worked in radio. I've been on TV before, um, but just sporadically. And speaking of speaking of the interaction and the fun, we've gotten a couple of uh, comments from YouTube. And uh, as usual, our crowd there is great. Um, Scott wanted to know if the pong that you were playing was beer pong. I was playing I think, the original Pong on a dedicated machine in the 70s, I guess, right? Late 70s, yeah. About yeah. that, yeah. Um, Inspector, who uh, seems to have become a, a big fan of ours, um, commented that regarding uh, the Warren County paper versus the New York Times, that it's, uh, it's not adaptable. 
uh, it's a you know, you're talking a national versus a, a local paper. He sees them as totally different beasts. Uh, I see you nodding there, Dan. You want to respond to him? Agree, disagree, elaborate? Very different. Um, the, 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 you're talking about a world-class publication. The New York Times is followed all over the place. Are, are you saying that the Warren County Reporter is not a world-class publication? I, I don't think you're saying that somehow. <laughs> Uh, it depends what story we write. On occasion, um, we've been, you know, on, uh, I mean, me and my staff have been on network television. Um, my paper's been quoted in Wikipedia. I'm in Wikipedia uh, as a source, not, a, not an article about myself. But uh, the one time, we, 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 it depends. If we could, like the White House alleged White House gate crashers, um, you know, we cover stuff locally. They live here. Or one, of course, is left with the uh, uh, lead guitar player for Journey, the band, and um, we—I've known him for 20 years. So when that story broke, um, we were on TV, Fox News. I was on Good Morning America because um, it was just—I uh, was the last person who had written anything about them. So I got a million calls. I, I turned down Inside Edition. I mean, it was so many calls you just didn't literally have time. So once in a while that happens, and then Skyline Drive is here, and. Um, I'll be right. I'm going to kill a giant mosquito. I was going to say there's something flying in your studio there. Yeah, this is worse than a stink bug because it's um, it's uh, this is awkward at best. But anyway, OK, it's I'll see. I'm going to. This is live from this New York. Live. It's see, Saturday is, night. <laughs> it's a very glamorous uh, job that I have here. Um, let me see if my Android will be up to the task. Oh, don't kill it, the Android. Definitely. But anyway, what, what was there, the next? Any other that. any other questions? Because I don't want to lose our yes, viewers. Yes, we, we had a great question, a, a comment from Scott. He says he likes the Warren County issue that you posted on Google Plus. It shows that you go after the ads which help the economy and the paper. So you want to talk a little bit about local advertising, what that's like? The smartest thing I ever heard Rupert Murdoch say: local ads are local content, just like the stories, and it's true. What does the movie theater got going that week? Um, what sale is on the Main Street store that you like? What yeah, restaurant sense. specials are going on? CNN can't touch us on that. Um, and uh, so we have all kinds of stuff like that. And because we're so popular and because we're free, that we have virtually everybody advertises in it. You know, like, I mean, in a town of 14,000, we have like 150 ads or more every issue. And, and obviously, it's working for the advertisers. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. So has, clearly, that's not what works for them. If you has look any, back oh, a year or two, you'll see the same advertisers as now. Yeah. So has any oh, anybody I, appo approached you to to buy you out at all? Have you had offers for that? You know, larger newspapers which have been rejected. Kind of, yeah, I've had yeah. Uh, at least once a year, twice a year, someone wants to buy it, and it's not for sale. Oh, oh, Dan, what we have here in Milad is even a smaller paper, and, the, and what, what makes sense is what the, you're talking about. The number one thing that sells papers here, if we mention everybody in the town's name in the paper. Um, yeah, if you go, for example, I mean, little tricks, like if you take, why do you think they publish a picture of the Little League teams in a big tab? Because every parent is going to buy five copies of the paper. And then yeah. um, you're going to create a tab and you're going to go and say to advertisers and you're, uh, that might sell stuff like kids' clothes or what have you, um, would you like to be in the Little League tab and, and support the Little League, you know, but by, by, you know, put an ad saying, we, you know, we're go, sure. go Rangers or whatever. Well, who's going to so, turn that down? You know? So speaking of the Little League and, you know, every parent and everything else, I have one final question for you. Why isn't there Mrs. McDermott or Lil McDermott's running around? Um, I almost, I, I don't want to get into my personal stuff. I almost got yeah, married once were. and um, uh, she ended it and I built a, it was not my decision. I was not happy about that, but I guess better before than after. And I kind of built up a, a wall for a while after that. Um, the little ones know, but I have um, I've had a different girlfriends, but what, it's very difficult when you're an entrepreneur and you're obsessed with your business and, and growing the business. Um, and I, I have 30 people that uh, perform different roles from delivering the paper to writing to selling ads 
um, all sorts of things. It's uh, it's hard, and and if you're ADD, you're, you're you tend to not be good at that anyway. Um, only an ADHD person would understand. Well, considering your age, since you're only in the mid to late twenties, I think you'll still have plenty of time. I don't have any more questions. Thank you, Dan. Hey, okay. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyone else from our, our regular panel or YouTube have some questions? We've got a couple of comments from YouTube. Uh, most of them are from the Mosquito Liberation Front. Um, Scott was concerned uh, that there were only mosquitoes there and no mice. Um, William, who I believe is joining us for the first time, uh, commented that going after him with your Android would be like one of those rock guys smashing his guitar on stage. Uh, please don't do that. Inspector made an excellent, excellent comment. Uh, he wanted to know why a guy like you who lived in Liberia is reacting to a mosquito like that. Um, because I, I learned um, to be afraid of mosquitoes in Liberia where uh, mosquitoes are the most deadly. Um, the, the, that's the, the, the living thing that kills the most people in the world is the mosquito. Mm -hmm. And having taken malaria pills and stuff, and, and just who wants to be bit, you know? It's not a pleasant yeah. experience, even if it's a little mosquito. And anything else from the rest of our uh, our panel in Hangout before I've got a final question? Anthony, you have anything? Eric? Eric, you have something? I'm going to I just got here, here, so. <laughs> nope. Errol? No, o Ole answer, asked my question already, why there wasn't a Mrs. McDermott. Happy to do it, Ben. Streak? Anybody? Okay, my, my final question, um, and I, I would point out we just got a comment from OTK to OTK saying it's been a really interesting show, uh, and I will have to agree, Dan, you're a, an extremely interesting person. Um, this has been a wonderful interview, so my final question is, uh, we're all here on Google+, Plus. what brought you to Google+, Plus? and then we'll launch into uh, the rest of our show for this week. So why are you here? That's the best question. I've always... Love Google stuff since I first heard about them when my sister, I think I said, look, hold on, let me look at Yahoo. And she's like, oh, Dan, that is so six weeks ago. You got to be on Google. I said, what? G, what is it? And that's how I first discovered Google.com um, when it was the old ghetto logo, you know. And, and, and it's interesting. You can go back at the archive.org and look at Google.com. You can go back to like their very first days. And I think you can still do a search. Um, with the, the old back. stuff, with the old logo, the so it's yeah. really cool. But um, I, that's when I fell in love, and I've always we've talked about this. You know, we we're critical sometimes, and we give them praise, but we try to be fair. It's not a love fest, but we all love Google in general. Um, but like a child or a parent, you know, sometimes they you, you have to criticize them. But um, I just have uh, such an affinity when I heard about the social network. <laughs> I don't remember where, maybe TechCrunch article or one of the first breaking things when they were calling it Circles, remember? They said a new, a new social network called Circles. So they kind of had an idea, but they didn't really. And I'm sure they got a chuckle, uh, you know, over in California. But yeah, so I just uh, heard about it. And then someone gave me an invite, uh, a friend of mine. And she said, oh, I have an invite. I was like, oh, my God, you know, get me in. And I just was like, this is so awesome. Oh, my God. And, and it was just awesome, the whole thing. And then immediately I discovered that the level of, of conversation was different from MySpace before Facebook and anything else I'd seen. It was more, um, it was easier to interact with intelligent people like you folks, like folks like Eric Rice or Alan Oleg, Pam, uh, J uh, the whole panel is intelligent or they wouldn't be here. And um, interesting to me or they wouldn't be here. So that's the thing for me. I just was like, because I'm, like I said, I'm ADHD. And so I always want to learn something new. I love uh, spending time with people who are smarter than me or better than me at certain things so I can learn. And uh, like the, my favorite line on the Chris Matthews show on MSNBC is that segment where he says, tell me something I don't know. And that's what I thirst for and hunger for. And that and Google Plus, if you're looking to meet new people who are interesting to you, Google Plus is the best possible way you could find that in a way that you can interact with them instead of just watching them like a TED conference. You, you know, if you want to interact with people on a TED conference level, this is the place. So that's what that's that's why I love it. Well said. Well, Dan, once again, thanks very much for uh, for being in the hot seat this week. And uh, I guess we, we turn it over to you for the rest of this evening's topics. 
I'm I'm shocked that you guys wanted to do that, and I don't I don't, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know, Dan. You got to realize you're a very interesting person. We've gotten at least a few people saying just how uh, how interesting it's been. Um, it is interesting to hear about the people who are behind the, the the things you discuss, and that's part of what makes Google Plus Google Plus. It's uh, it's not just topics, which is what a lot of people say. It's the people behind those topics. You know, it's a very multi-dimensional thing. So thanks, thanks again for, for being part of it. Absolutely. Well, that was fun. Uh, it was Oleg's idea, and then Alan was like, "Yeah, yeah, 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 let's do it." You know, and I figured it would be um, more of a stressful thing, but it was. Uh, it, I hope I, I I'm glad some people found it interesting. Um, but um, okay, so uh, we have other topics besides me, um, and uh, I'm looking for them. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about Google Drive. What did we're, I say? We're we going to recap what we talked about Google yeah. Drive already. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to take a, 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 a two minute uh, breather, and you guys, um, let's talk about Drive. I know people have been playing with it. It's been characterized. I was surprised even on Mashable. Bottom line, it's Dropbox, but more space and for less money. And I was like, whoa, you know. You know, um, and I got to admit, when I first saw it, that was the attitude I was approaching it with. Is you know, how is this going to compare with Dropbox, and and what is the big, um, the, what what's the big thing that Google is going to introduce with it? And when I saw that it was really just Google Docs with a lot more, I'm like, I I'm missing something here. What's the the big catch? And gonna, it wasn't until we had a, a big whole hangout with Oleg this week. That Oleg said, no, you, it's got the search, it's got the optical character recognition. And then I said, oh, yeah. And it's got this API. And once you get the API there, that um, you now have the ability to essentially be able to edit any file type. Once you get that, it really kind of, um, it really kind of exploded for me just how big and powerful it is. And I guess it made me realize that Google really badly named the product. I mean, uh, let, okay, me, let me say Oleg one thing, again, and then please. I'm going to throw it to, to Oleg and Alan uh, and, and the rest of the panel. The, the, you said something, Alan, that's really interesting to me. You said the biggest mistake they made is calling it Google Drive because that immediately makes it seem like um, it's, it's another Dropbox, but more space and cheaper. And the next right. one to come along will have even more space and be cheaper. So it doesn't matter. But um, And then I said you said that they should have called it uh, – like Google drive Docs plus. plus Google Docs plus and then I said you know what they should have made they should have made but done that and they should have I upped your Annie and I said they should have made you join Google Plus to get it um, if they were you know but I'm not going to tell Google how to run their business obviously they're somewhat successful so but uh, and and, and b before you get into the weeds about the API and stuff like that for the for the person who hasn't used it yet or the person who has just signed up and their Google Docs magically transferred apparently or whatever. Explain why this is a why for the average user this is a bigger deal than just a virtual sure. e drive. Sure. Uh, basically in my the, the way I see um, Google Drive both today and where it's going is it's two major components. And the the component that everyone is focusing on right now is the fact that um, that you can in, install something on your desktop and you can manipulate files from your desktop and these files get shared into the cloud. And that's the new aspect of it that I think most people see. And it's, it's significant. I mean, I'm not going to say that, you know, so what? But uh, it's not the really big and important thing behind it. And I think what really is big and important is the fact that they took their concept behind Google Docs the fact that you could store your documents in the cloud, the fact that you can manipulate your documents in the cloud. You edit them. This is where you go to, to do your word processing now. This is where you go to do your spreadsheets. This is where you have your presentations in the cloud. You can edit them from anywhere. You can collaborate with other people in real time from anywhere. And they then said, not only will we do this for these four document types, we will make it so that Anybody, any software manufacturer can create their application and those will work on these files that are stored in the cloud. So now what it means is that if you have mm. um, a specialized accounting application, for example, 
And up until now, it's been using only files on your machine. If you put those files on Google Drive, and if that software manufacturer makes a Google Drive compatible version of your program, poof, just like mm -hmm. that, you can now edit those files from anywhere. And accounting might be a kind of a sensitive way, but when you start looking at it and saying, well, you can now edit photographs, poof, from anywhere. You can now start you know, editing um, documents in various formats that you've never seen before. Yes. Edit them from anywhere, work on them. That's really where the power of, of Google Drive has come in. And that's so way that's more than what Dropbox is doing. And I see a lot of people are eager to get in. Sreek, you first, and then we're going to go to Bruce. So let me ask oh. you a question there. So basically, you're not, again, looking at, us, at it as docs. You're looking at it as data. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, it's well, of... I, No, that's a good point. I guess I see it as docs in the same sense that um, I can, you know, I, I work... I work on files as documents. Documents are more than just text. Right. Document, no, what, you know, I've got spreadsheet documents. I've got presentation documents. What, so what I was it, saying is... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, uh, no, no, I cut you off twice now. Go ahead. Now, Alan, Alan one, one of the things hey. that I don't know if you know right. that, that you two... Hang on a second. Hang on. Let's, 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 let's finish with Sarik and Bruce, and then we'll go back to you. Well, what I'm saying is, let's say somebody made... The, the comment you made about uh, a Google Drive compatible application, right? So that's a, that's a very interesting concept because uh, anybody who's going to make, and it basically allows you to keep your data in your Google Drive. And then what I'm saying is instead of looking at, if it's an Excel sheet, for example, I'm not talking about, um, uh, you know, um, doc file or PowerPoint or anything. If there is an application out there which can process the data you have in your Google Drive, because it's compatible with that. From that moment onwards, I'm not looking at my Excel sheet as uh, a spreadsheet. I'm looking at it as data in the application. Right. And you see, I, I think I, the, I guess my approach, and I see what you're saying there. When I think of it, I now think of these, these documents. I now think of, um, you know, and yes, that's, that's a chunk of data. And that data could be in a graphical form. It can be in numeric columns. It could be in text. And I've got a program manipulating it. And, Thinking of it as data is a very, um, I guess it's a very technical way of thinking of it. And I know you're a technical guy, and I'm a technical guy. Yeah, but I'm thinking, you know, when I explain it to my parents, I'm going to be saying, look, all of uh, every every program you used to run on your computer, you can now run on the web, and the files that it saves are now stored out there in the cloud, and mm -hmm. that's that's a big shift. I mean, they've been, you know, people have been talking about this sort of thing for a long time. You know what but I'm happy really about? This is the first way to, to bring I, it down to a personal level. You know what you I'm bet. happy about? I'm happy about the fact that you accept that it's a much better thing as opposed to the, the day we first posted about Google Drive, the day we came out, and you oh, said, it is, oh. It is, a, it is a much better thing, but I have a small list of, mis of, of big problems with it, and it has some huge problems right now. Of course. Now. Harold, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, well, one of the things I just wanted to point out is that for the, I didn't know, most people don't know this, but you can upload your video up there. I uploaded a video up there, and what, what happens to it, though, is what's really surprised me, it goes up to YouTube, and, and you can go and edit it in YouTube. So yes. when you upload a video to the drive, it doesn't, I thought it would stay on that drive, but it doesn't. It's up in your uh, YouTube section. I, I didn't actually know that it goes into YouTube, although I, I might have seen that at some point. But the big deal but, about it is that you have the, the video editing capability. Yeah. Um, I, I, Drive sorry, is not just a place to store things, it's a place to, to work with things. There's, can, an can, app, there's an app called Wii Video that you can get from the uh, marketplace, and it allows you to it's specifically for video editing using Google Drive. So could you put up like database files and then use a create an Android app to kind of display uh, the, the searchable items from that database. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, see, that's, that is so cool right there. Yeah. So you'd be able to develop an app and then have a, you know, basically right. a cloud database uh, be cloud, able to display as, information. As a cloud database, there are some gotchas. Right now with the way the API is working, it's, you know, I'm not sure I would store my, um, my SQL database on there right now. Yeah, but, but if you were if you were rendering just information to a smartphone or you know just think about it, think about an MVB file cool. from Access, for example. Right, I'm I'm not sure I would do that to be honest. Okay. But, um, but I think that's where some of this is going, and I think there's certainly right. a, a potential there. 
Um, yeah, that's a huge. Let's forgot, let's let's talk a little bit about what it is for some people. Maybe they don't you know uh, understand what the, the situation is in terms of all the detail. Basic, Give a practical example. Well, it, it's not so much. You, are you talking to me or to Alan? Both of you. Okay. I have yeah. a great. I have an example. Say, 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 for example, say I have a uh, RV travel, my website, and I want to show all these different things. What happens when you go into different areas and different cities or different? And there's different regulations about RVs or whatever like that. I could store that information in a central database, have write a little iPhone app, and then have them access that information. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, but you no, could do that before, that's Jeff. That's right. not there. Google Drive shines. So you could do that. Right. Before. That's really what this is for. This is for your data, Jeff. Yeah, this but I'm saying you can. This is I mean, it, it, oh. There, there are things you can do with public data, but this right. is really perfectly suited for for your data, your right. files, your personal stuff. But right. he wants to share with us. The, the thing about Google Drive, uh, you know, where it's become... I, Oleg, I just want to interrupt for a second. Yeah. For all of our viewers on YouTube, we wanted to let you know that Dan has gotten the mosquito. Yes. This is very important. <laughs> um, yeah. he, he posted it to YouTube. I want all of us to make sure and to, to acknowledge our fearless bug hunter, Dan McDermott, who is now returning has to left the chair. The room. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, Oleg, go ahead. I, I wanted to, to get that breaking news here. No problem. Uh, that's one of the beauties of the Hangouts. You can actually get breaking news right in the middle of it. That's why it's so much better than newspapers, too. Um, so basically, what I was going to say was, number one, you know, the things, some of the things that we're talking about here could have been done before. It's not like some big new discovery that wasn't there before. One of the uh, things that people write about, if you look at all the reports, you know, is it another Dropbox, or not another Dropbox? Yes, it's definitely similar in many ways to Dropbox, because you can, everything you can do in Dropbox, you can do with Google Drive. So initially, when they started having reports about five gigabyte drive, Google Drive uh, coming out, I personally was looking for a lot more than just a five gigabyte virtual storage because other people have done it before. People like Dropbox have done it really well. There were other people like Bugs.net. There's uh, right. I, I think the the, 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 all kinds the of local things. file storage was important, but by no means is it even. You know, it's no, no, not by no means the biggest feature here. You get stuff on the cloud before, it's nothing new. People like Dropbox had some API as well. There were some apps people wrote to do some things. The reason this is a huge deal in my view, in addition to what Alan said, is that you had Google Docs before. I mean, that's vast difference. That, you know, most people who write these articles about it's another Dropbox, another Dropbox. It's not another Dropbox. You do not have Office-type applications running on Dropbox. You do with Google Drive. And that came from Google Docs or Google Apps, depending on how you want to talk about it. But essentially, you're getting an Office-type applications running with information being stored on the Google Drive. And that's very similar to what you had before with Google Docs. You stored information in the cloud. The difference before was that you had a limited amount of space. And now they opened it up so you don't really have almost any limitations in space because you can buy as much space as you want yeah. I, I think awesome. the expandability feature is, it's a major, I mean, it's, it's, it's not new for Google, forward. but it is significant. Second thing is, because of the API, and you can develop applications, they have tons of applications already on Google Marketplace for Google Docs, and now for Google Drive. Another thing that's a big deal about it is that in addition to having these applications, and you're able to share all this information with people, with them being able to both edit this information or just view it. And that's a big deal that was in Google Docs before. It transferred now with this new capability as well. But the beautiful thing about that is, for example, like with Google Spreadsheets, for those who haven't used this before, is you can actually go back to any revision of the document. It's actually storing all this stuff out there. And Google Drive people will tell you, be careful to store all this stuff, because if you have large files and you want to keep all the revisions, it's going to add up your space in no time. So you've got to be careful about syncing it to the cloud and that's a little technical thing. But the bottom line is, if you wanted to collaborate with other people, number one, you can do that with as many people as you wish on any particular document. And number two, you can also get in to any previous revision you want, which you know people ask, can you do backups? Of course, you no, do. That, that, that's an excellent point, that, that we've got these you know, all of these high-class features in here. I know, exactly. Bruce, you had all of it is now inherent in this Google Drive now. If you're talking about the gentleman one, uh, named William something, William Bryant made a comment about this being uh, called Drive. He said, what did he say about the Drive? He said, uh, you can't really host a document directly from the Drive without framing. 
No, no, you, you had said something earlier around the time that I said uh, that I was talking yeah. about how it was Docs Plus. Yeah, and and that's you know it, it's definitely basically the next kind of uh, deal about Docs, but the Docs were not as prominent as they will be now because of Google Drive. But again, you're looking at even more important reasons why this is so cool is because they're putting it into the entire Google infrastructure in terms of yeah. intercommunication being connected with things like Google Plus, being connected with things like Gmail, for example. All of these things are coming, you know, we talked before about all this integration of Google services. We're seeing that be happening in front of our eyes. And this Google Drive introduction of that, the only thing that I would say negative so far from what I've seen, because it seems like it works pretty fast and does things exactly how it should uh, do it. And I've been a big proponent, a big user of Google Apps before. And I've used it for a number of my clients and business and stuff, migrated people from Microsoft Exchange. Definitely recommend it without any questions. So this is actually even better than it was before, but was very familiar with the application side of it. And in terms of integration, I mean, another thing that, you know, uh, if those who don't know, another thing it does is when you put something out there on Google Drive, it synchronizes it automatically with all your other devices. So if you have a tablet and if you have a smartphone, if you have, you have, access, you don't necessarily have the editing capability similar on all these devices. For example, it's unlikely you'd be able to comfortably edit a video on your phone that has 3.2 inch screen, for example, compared to doing it on a desktop. So some of these things are not ubiquitous everywhere, but you will get to be able to get to this data from any of these devices and you'll be able to upload data there from any of these devices as well and it will synchronize them accordingly. Which is okay. Um, I, I know, Bruce, you had some comments earlier, and then I want to cover some of the stuff that's on YouTube. Bruce, what, what were your thoughts on I have drive? one more point to make well, before we give it to Bruce. And the last point I was going to make is that the only thing that I don't like so far yeah. about Google Drive... Well, we'll, we'll cover don't likes in a minute. No, we'll, like, we'll cover don't likes in a minute, because I've got a long list. Okay. Now, we'll cover that in a minute, really. I promise you. Bruce, go ahead. Well, I'm kind of late to the party because I was at a family party, but I've enjoyed uh, the discussion as, as it stands so far. Besides the things that you've already talked about, there are obviously some things about Google Drive that are going to be really specific to collaboration and editing and stuff like that. But I do like the CNET article that I posted in the chat, you know, where um, the author Stephen Shanklin says, Google Drive, SkyDrive, Dropbacks, he heck, use them all. And so I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for redundancy in, uh, in protection, You're not putting all your eggs in one basket. So you know, I welcome Google Cloud for all the reasons that you've talked about. I like it. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a further expansion of the Google Mall. It's just one more you know, anchor store to everything else that they have to offer. So I really like it. But, but I do agree with the author. I mean, you know, it's not one or the other. Use them all. I've got 50 gigabytes on box. I've got Dropbox, and I, I don't have... You know, Microsoft. But, but it's not that easy, though, Bruce, when you start talking about applications. You cannot have all these baskets all over the place and have your data be disparate like this. Well, because it goes, it why it not, goes not, to the, you put the right things in the right place. You right, know? exactly. And then that makes perfect sense. Um, so some comments that we had from, uh, mostly from YouTube. Um, OTK, OTK says, um, oh, no, that's not the one I wanted to start with. I, I, she basically commented, uh, Dan, she hopes that you keep uh, this in your McDermott report. Uh, YouTube so that people can see it later because uh, it really actually but it really ties everything that you do together um, William Byrne when I commented about uh, the Docs plus he said you create a real collaboration space referring to this he goes, really what drives you so I guess he was disagreeing with me thinking that that drive was a uh, I'm, I'm, William can you actually clarify were you being sarcastic there or not because I can easily read that as sarcasm but I'm a sarcastic guy. Yeah. Um, he's pointed out that there are now more, more file types that are available under Create. Uh, there have been three new ones that have been added from Google. Plus, the, one of the, the neat features is that some of the market apps will let you create even more new document types. As I said, that's the part of the great feature of this. Uh, when talking about video, video OTK to OTK, I'm just going to refer to you as Kate from now on. Um, Kate asked, does it automatically make the video public? And William helped out and said, uh, yes, William helped out and replied, no, it doesn't automatically make the videos public. Um, as things have scrolled off my screen, so I apologize for a moment. Um, uh, Dimolander su uh, suggests that the magic with Drive is not known yet. 
it's going to follow, like with all the stuff that Google does. They tried hard with Buzz uh, and with Wave, two huge platforms, but it wasn't until Google Plus and Google Drive that they really started uh, getting some of this, I think. And I think in some ways that's true. Um, yeah. With Google Drive, we've really only begun to scratch the surface of it. I think the, the big thing about Google Drive is that a lot of the, the really wow parts that we're going to see aren't all going to come from Google. It's going to come from the, the application developers. So just like the iPhone, mm -hmm. the apps were the big thing. Android, the apps were the big thing. I think in Google Drive, the apps are going to start being the big thing. And we're going to see some of that coming. Um, William Byrne pointed out, and I, I'm not sure I remember exactly what he's replying to, uh, you can't really host a document directly from Drive without framing. Oh, and that's referring to uh, making a document publicly available from Drive. Um, I think yeah, it's Brian Allen. Said, but he wasn't sarcastic with what he's saying. He says he Drive, he wasn't more drive okay. can have multiple meanings. It makes sense. Absolutely. I agree with him. I think it does make sense. I think the problem with using the term Drive is that it, it shifted the focus to the wrong place. It gave it the wrong spin. And it's got a lot of people thinking that it's nothing more than a, a glorified Dropbox. Storage. And yeah. It's, yeah. And That's it's right. going to take Google uh, a lot of effort and marketing, as usual, to get over those initial reactions. That's, and yeah, that sense. actually goes great into what I think is the next topic, and that is the problems with Drive. Okay. And in my mind, the biggest problem that they have, and don't get me wrong, I think Drive is awesome. I really do. I think the biggest problem that Drive has is they launched it out of the gate with horrible, horrible marketing. And the first yes. thing was it's called Drive. So really let's talk about some specific. That's some specifics, Alan. Are there specific things other than the name? You know, Oleg. I can. I, name plus doesn't make much sense either. But obviously, you know, good enough. Yeah, but, but go, name, yeah, but go look at Google Plus and and see the kind of problems that it's had getting adopted. Well, and yes, we're going to have that argument yeah. many more times, I'm sure. Million accounts in less than a year, I think they did okay. But do you have any specific negatives about Google Drive? I think te from, from technical points of view, there are several significant negatives still going on. Um, the fact that you it doesn't support multiple logins right now on the client side. In fact, it doesn't even support it very well on the server side. Uh, has been a significant problem in the past. It's a serious problem now. Um, it is a serious problem. The fact, you know, a lot of people still have multiple Google accounts. You've got your personal Google account. You've got your business Google account. And only one of them at a time will work on Google Drive. Um, so, any other problems? Okay. I, uh, I did have several of them. I'm trying to remember all of them right now. There are some technical aspects with the API that are faulty. If you go look at the support forum, there are a lot of people asking questions like, how do I specify a file path? And the answer is, you don't. And the right. answer is, well, exactly. what are you going to, what's the solution? What's the replacement? What's the alternative? And the answer is, you don't. I've got, so a, I've got a question, I, um, Alan, uh, and, and I want to go to the share button next. Um, but I, I, what I'm curious about, this, is, this was introduced as a better than Dropbox virtual hard disk. But no, it was as introduced you, as the evolution of Google Docs. That's what it was introduced like. It wasn't introduced. Not in the news Google. media, Oleg. I have to differ. No. Um, it was I, yeah, I, I agree and, with Dan. That's the problem, Oleg. Because of the name. Everyone perceives and, it as better than Dropbox. As, as just like Dropbox, but. In the same way that, the that Google, in, in the uh, same way that Google Plus was, is it a Facebook killer? It's totally right. different. I mean, it, 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 it's. It's similar, but it's very no, but different. This is not um, different. This is this is like Dropbox. It can do everything Dropbox does. You can have storage. You can have synchronization across multiple devices. It's just like Dropbox. So there's nothing wrong with comparing it. It's just more than just like Dropbox. I, I don't think. But Google I mean, I think an automobile. It's like saying, you know, when the automobile came along, it was just like okay. uh, a horse-driven buggy. Uh, because it gets you to from point A to point B. Well, but no, it, it also has a radio and it has, you know, it, it's other stuff. So the question I have is, um, we're looking at this with, you know, virgin new eyes, right? Um, where is this going to go to? Just like when Facebook started, it was a, a way for college kids to talk to each other. 
and now it's become this worldwide phenomenon that has uh, participated in revolutions in foreign countries and what have you. And Google Plus started out as uh, the, a social component or whatever you want to call it, and now it's become this massive uh, thing where, you know, the Dalai Lama and, and Barack Obama, and President Obama, and um, the NFL scouts, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but, you know, are, are using it. So it's going to evolve, but where do you see in a year um, what will – how will people refer to and think about Google Drive? What will it matter to them? You know, wh well, I, where are we going with this? I disagree that they did poor job in marketing. I think I, I, everything is, if, if you look at their videos that they released when they released Google Drive, uh, I think they're just as well done as anything else Google has done in terms of other products they released. And the fact that they started with some videos saying you whoa, can- Whoa, 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 stop, stop. Oh, like you saying their marketing is just as good as all of their other marketing. Is that what you just said? I'm just saying I like their video for Google Drive as much as I like a bunch of videos they've done for Chrome, a bunch of other things. That's all. And I'm saying that what they've done, like in the very first video I got, was the video that talked about taking your data, putting it out there in the, cl in the cloud, and being able to access it from multiple devices. That's basically the message of the first video I got. And that's obviously a storage in the cloud, what most of the regular non-tech people know at this point and can understand easily enough, and that's how they're introducing the whole concept to the crowds, uh, mainstream okay. crowds. Okay, so you're over that. Well, yeah. the thing that I see that's wrong with that is that they're saying, "Hey, we're just like Dropbox." No, I think they're. I think oh. they're, they're. I think they're saying. I, I don't think it's just Dropbox. I think they're saying we're we're better than Dropbox. We're better than iCloud. We're better than. They're you know, not they're saying just, that at all. They're uh, simply let me, let me, Okay, hold it. Now, if you want, guys want to have a panel discussion, then everyone has to be able to talk, okay? okay. So if, let me finish my thought, and then you can just clobber the heck out of me. But, no, proceed, uh, let, let me, <laughs> Especially since you're agreeing with me. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, you know, give them a, you know, it's out a week, okay? Um, it's, they're competing on so many different levels and they're just getting eyeballs on their product line. And they're, all they're, they're trying to do is get the eyeballs on their product line. It's a great little device that they put out there and it's going to, you know, just going to grow like everything else they've done. It's incremental. That's but my here's, beat, here's beat my concern, Jeff. Here's my concern with that, Jeff. If you say it's been out a week, um, they're getting eyeballs on the product. That's great. The problem is what people are seeing, the first reaction that people are seeing, the first reaction that you're seeing in 90% of the articles about it, the first impression, and first impressions are lasting impressions, the first impression is, this is Dropbox. Let me, let me give you a comparison. I, I when, agree. Let, I, I agree. Let me give you a comparison. When Google launched Gmail, the first impression that people had, you know, people were saying, oh, they're, Google's launching web-based mail. So what? Yahoo has web-based mail. Everyone has web-based mail. When Google launched Gmail, they said, Gmail is different. It isn't just email. We've got more space. We've got a UI that you've never seen before. In fact, it's such a good UI, it looks just like the UI that you're used to on your desktop. This is, you know, they basically said, we are in, you know, they, they, they came out of the box and the impression that everyone had immediately was that this was something new and revolutionary. The impression that everyone had of Google Drive is it's Dropbox. The impression everyone has of Google Plus is it's Facebook. They have to fight that impression and that's a tough tough thing to fight. All right, let me go, let me go to Pam and then let's move let's let's move to the um share button um which i know our viewers are we're really going to be sharing? waiting for oh, this no, we're not yeah. done with the problems yet <laughs> we're really going to share okay, we, we, all right we, we could stick on it uh I, I, okay uh okay really quick cam go ahead all right what what i want to know alan and um oleg is two things number one I uploaded a file, a folder of pictures. I want to know, can I share that folder of pictures with my sister-in-law? That's number okay. one. Number two, can does my sister-in-law have to have a Google account for me to share that with her? You can That's share, it. no question there, absolutely. As far as her having an account, um, 
I don't think so, Oleg, because isn't it the same thing as Google Docs where you can just share a link? Bam, bam, slow down. I think you do. I think she will. Bam. The reason being is when you share something in Google Plus, you're able to share it with email addresses, and then people who are not on Google Plus will still be able to consume. They'll just get an email with the stuff shared there. I know that definitely works. But when you're doing stuff on Google Docs and you share, then they need to be able to log in to Google Docs to get to this information. And they will not be able to get to log into Google Docs without having a Google account. So I think the second answer, even though I'm not 100% positive, I would say 99% positive, she will need to have a Google account to be able to actually. I don't think get that's it. accurate, Oleg, because, for example, okay. many times, like um, the, the Google Plus Week topic list, right? Um, it, it's uh, viewable and editable by anybody. And if you had to be logged in, then. We wouldn't see all these, uh, like when Alan's in there, often it says anonymous user 9 or 12 is, is editing the document. Um, I don't think you have to. I think if you make it public, publicly viewable and editable by anybody, um, or publicly viewable, you know, not, right. not and, and or, right. Um, right. that I think anybody can see it. Well, if that's the case, then the answer would be yes, Pam. Yeah. Be able to I, do I, don't, I don't want anyone to see it. I just want her to get right. it. No, nobody else but she will be able to do it. Yeah, if you share it just with her, then don't worry about that. Nobody else will see it. But but what Dan said is true. I have seen that. So that means that she should be able. Go ahead and just give it a try. Just share it with her email address and then see if she can get into it. And then I, uh, we, we, had, we have a comment from, uh, from YouTube, which is relevant to this. This is actually something that uh, came up in our earlier discussion earlier this week um, about uh, Google Drive. There were, the message from Inspector, and I'm going to read it verbatim because he chastised me once already on this. Good. Um, uh, where'd it go? It scrolled off. Uh, as I've said before, G Drive is not just like Dropbox, and for me, not better. I use Dropbox mostly to store audio, video, and image files that I want to share. G Drive is not good at all three. In fact, he says that it is not good, and I, I apologize, I'm not reading you verbatim uh, because we're on the air. Uh, it's not good at sharing. Uh, I've never used Google Docs much, thus my lack of excitement and enthusiasm I'm seeing among those who do. Um, I'm going to reply by saying I understand what you're saying, and uh, I still need to test it more for some of the, the public sharing, the public streaming, some of the public stuff that he's identified as a problem. Um, when I went and tested some things that were publicly shared and tried to get them into my G Drive, I had problems doing so, so there are issues with that as well. Uh, I do think there are some issues with how things are shared and how you can get things that are shared into your Google Drive. So there, there are issues there to address. That was one of the bugs that I uh, that I wanted to bring up as, as still problematic. Um, but he does raise an interesting issue, and he raises one that I've actually heard a lot of other people say, and that's that this sounds a, very similar in some ways to what they're now selling with, uh, with Google Play Music, but it's a totally different creature. <clears throat> it's on the basically like it's on the other side of the world from from Google Play Music. You can't do the same sort of streaming. Um, what do you think about that, Oleg? Well, basically, I mean, that, this is one of the negative things I was going to say is that right now, you know, specifically talking, I think this gentleman is partially wrong because he should use Google Docs more and do the sharing. You can see that actually does work and works pretty well. I've done projects with newsletters where there were pictures. And there was documents in Google Docs and shared between multiple people. It worked great. It worked perfect. Some people. Well, no, no, no. His concern about sharing, and, and I'm going to apologize in advance to him if I'm mischaracterizing him. Yeah. Um, his concern about the sharing isn't so much sharing it with someone so that they can edit it. It's it's sharing it so with someone so that uh, the video can get streamed, or that the audio can get streamed. Well, because or that the the images are directly embeddable into something else. He's talking about embeddability of these. Things. Right, right, right. And right now, exactly, I agree. And from that standpoint, basically, their their model so far has been you're just sharing ability to access the data. Period. Not to do anything with the data in terms of streaming or anything else, but just being able. You're you're putting a video in a folder. You're saying share the folder. The other person will be able to access the folder and double click to open that video and play it using their player on their machine. That will work. One of the problems that they have, in terms of problems that I personally think that they have, is if you look at, for example, Picasa, it's a very confusing environment. Because what you have is you have Picasa with the limit of how much you can put in 
in Picasso itself, you know, they have certain limitations. Then you have, when I'm talking about Picasso web, since we're talking about the cloud here, then you have the situation with the Google Plus, which is using Picasso, but you don't have any limitations on how many pictures you can put in. So that's already becoming a confusing issue. Now you go with point three, and you're saying you can also share information on, like pictures on Google Drive, which of course raises the question, why would you want to do that when you already have sharing set up and doing it through Google Plus? So those are kind of strange things that they need to work out because it's confusing. It's not that it doesn't work, it's confusing. The other point I wanted to share about the negative aspect of it so far is that I agree with basically following up with what you said earlier, and that is, you know, there were some articles people wrote saying that Google, just like Dropbox, set you up on a, you know, there was a Forbes article, I think, uh, on your computer as another drive. That is not an accurate statement. Okay, first of all, neither Dropbox nor Google Drive is a separate drive as you would look at Windows drives. Windows drives, you usually have a letter of alphabet associated with that drive. You have drive C, which is your hard drive, drive A, your floppy disk in, in the past. I thought and, they got rid of drive lettering decades ago. You mean they still have that? No, yeah. of course they do. But I'm just saying they don't have, there is no drive for Google Drive, and there is no drive for Dropbox. You cannot access it like an external device you can access on, on Windows. So that part right there adds to your comment about you cannot put in a URL. You cannot say open and give it a Google Drive letter because there is no Google Drive letter. So that that's another thing that they noticed that they you know, will have to address in some way because it's not another drive. But it's no different than Dropbox because you do get a folder that, that you know all your information is stored in, and then it will sync automatically and all this other good stuff. So, so those are the, just a couple of things that I think they need to address to get rid of the confusion. But in terms of being able to share documents and pictures and everything else, I think it works great. I mean, I've used it before on Google Docs. I'm sure it worked just as well on Google Drive right now. And what, it does work. One of the, one of the key things, of course, is is to be able to share things, and and that brings up um, another uh, thing that was kind of missed in this whole drive conversation. Uh, what a last segue, week. Dan! That was excellent. I I, I got some game. Um, so uh, th there was a, there was a new button added that you can embed. Uh, tell us about that, Alan. Sure. One of the um, one of the apparently one of the complaints that a lot of people have made. Uh, since the beginning was that although that the, the plus one button that we've started seeing on a lot of websites, it's great if you want to say that you know you're interested in something or whatever, but they kind of tacked on the sharing feature with it. So it became that if you wanted to share a news article that somebody had posted, for example, you needed to know that you wanted to click on plus one, and then once you clicked on plus one, you would have this share box pop up. Um, they've gotten a lot of feedback that, hey, Facebook has... Uh, both a like and a share button uh, that do two that can do two different things. When is Google going to get the same thing? And the answer is uh, now. Finally, they have the same thing. So they introduced the uh, the Google Plus share button. It is similarly colored to the Plus One button. It's it's the red text on a kind of whitish gray background. Um, and if you click on it, it works more or less the same way. It lets you enter in a statement text. It lets you enter in who you want to share it with, and it lets you share. Uh, contents that are on a, a page. So now uh, editors or people who edit pages have the option of whether they want to make it so that you can plus one an article and share it when it plus ones, or if you just want to share an article or share a page or share a snippet or whatever. So this is, uh, in some ways, it's um, giving some flexibility to the whole thing, but it's also, I don't know, I'm a little concerned that it's going to add some confusion. But apparently this was a heavily wanted feature, so here's Google um, meeting user demand. I I don't uh, I don't think that's necessarily a, a good idea. You know, I I rather had gotten used to the plus one button giving me the sharing right. box that comes up. I think it's Google Plus. When you plus one, you plus one, but it gives you the option that if you don't want to share it, then you can close down that that sharing box. I. I don't see where it's important to be like Facebook in that way. I, I kind of like the distinction and the uh, uniqueness of, of the plus one share combo type thing, but that's just me. And of course, Bruce is a, is the last remaining wave user. <laughs> I'm just Waves. thinking on Bruce. I love Bruce. Just, just warning to everybody, wave goes away in three days. Yeah. Are you three serious? So this, this was a, I, I'm a prognosticator on top of all the other things we talked about. 
Yes, you're a prophet. One of the things also that I think was uh, speaking of the plus one and speaking of fully done in this particular instance on the drive is picture sharing is very awkward right now when you click on, if you select an image and then you want to share it on Google Drive, it's I mean, the other way around. You have an image and you're trying to share it on Google Plus. It's really weird the way they have it set up right now because they have this... Uh, so moving on, Dan. I think we're I think yeah. we're done with the, the sharing. I, th I think what we should do uh, talk about the Hangouts. Um, I remember when, when when we first started with Google right. Plus, the, the Hangouts were initially, uh, as, as Chi Chu told us once in a Hangout, that uh, you know it started out as their concept of a way to communicate with your friends because this was all the social aspect of Google Plus, and then a bunch of us leapt very quickly on. And viewed this as a way of outreach, a way to incorporate a panel um, into uh, a show of sorts, like what we do, and also TV stations um, like like Sarah, Sarah Hills, uh, uh, KOMU, and Jason uh, Solis, uh, KUAM, and and so many others now. Um, look at it as a free satellite truck or nine free satellite trucks where they can bring in a panel. So lately, I mean, it started, the first big splash was uh, the Dalai Lama, which was just, I mean, wow, you know. And then uh, President Obama did a hangout. And now Bob Schieffer from CBS News, who's not, as I said in the intro, isn't someone you associate with cutting edge technology, but, you know, maybe he is a geek and just hides it well. Um and then uh, now the top NFL draft picks are uh, d just did a hangout, I think, yesterday. So it, it's I, I see more and more. I mean, I'm waiting to see like McLaughlin Group, which has a does not have the most modern set, you know, or techniques. Um, I'm waiting to see everybody uh, start using this uh, to be. I don't know if it's it's a race to be on the cutting edge, like to get their Twitter account or or if it's they're figuring out what an amazing tool this is. I still see some hesitation from Google to admit or concede that it is something bigger than they expected. And as quickly as, as they'll say, um, oh, we're not, we can't cater to the broadcasters because this is supposed to be a way for three or four friends or colleagues to get together and have an intimate chat. Um, but at the same time, they created Hangouts on Air. So they're obviously acknowledging um, the potential, you know, for a mass viewership. Like if Britney Spears did a Hangout, I mean, imagine, you, you know, she'd break the bank on the viewers. So what are your thoughts about this trend? We've, we've referred to this many times as, you know, the quote unquote killer app, right? But um, now we're seeing it really gain traction. And it's exciting because we're seeing... Uh, Regular people you don't associate with tech. I mean, not if Leo Laporte did a hangout, you know, okay, it's Leo Laporte. But when NFL draft picks do a hangout or the Dalai Lama, you know, who? I mean, it's a whole different game. The Dalai what are your Lama is actually on this? an odd. The Dalai Lama is actually an odd one because he is very, very technologically savvy. He's a very interesting character, all told. But you know, I, I do think it's um, it's interesting and it's exciting and. I, you know, I wouldn't even say the mainstreaming of something, but just the widespread adoption of it. The fact that so many different people are using it in so many different ways um, is both exciting on some level, but also a bit concerning on some level. Because you're right, I, I think Dan's right that Google didn't fully anticipate it, and they didn't fully prepare for it. And I'm worried about some of the problems that are going to start creeping in that they haven't uh, fully prepared for. Um, what are your thoughts on this, Bruce? Yeah, I, um, I, I've i enjoyed, you know, watching some of these uh, TV show type hangouts. And I, I think the good thing about, uh, about the hangouts, with, you know, with these public people, it does give uh, greater advertisement and notoriety to the whole platform. So I think, uh, I think it's a good thing that, uh, you know, that more, uh, you know, the TV station. I've enjoyed watching those. In fact, uh, I'm more likely to watch a hangout on air that I'm not able to participate in by clicking on the YouTube video 
if it's you know one of those TV stations that are broadcasting because they've always they always have some interesting things uh, that they pull out. So um, I'm really I'm really enjoying that. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Well, I mean, I think it's your perspective, and, I, and that's that is kind of where I was going. Uh, Streak, what are your thoughts on um, the uh, the the increase in Hangout adoptance? Adopt yeah, maybe I'll find an English word in there somewhere. Adoption. There we go. Adoption. <laughs> I was trying to say that. Uh, I mean, it's still in the very early stages, but um, I I don't know whether we have a lot of um, you know mainstream adaptation, adaptation, whatever it is, adaptation. Okay. <laughs> so let's adoption, keep making up words here. Adoption, right? So, uh, but it is improving. It it is it is increasing all the time. That's what I see. Um, and I get, I mean, I, I, let me just circle back to this. I get a lot of questions from friends and family who has never used Google Plus before about how do we do Hangouts? We have been hearing about Hangouts and I'm pleasantly surprised because there are a lot of people who say, oh, I don't care about Google Plus, but uh, I heard that this Hangout thingy is pretty cool. So, you know, can you show us how to do it? You know, uh, so that is that is pretty good, and then that that is just the mainstreaming part of it. The other side of it is the uh, I'm not saying money spinning. When I say commercial, uh, people like Sarah Hill who uh, uses it for television, or you know, I can't even call it television anymore. Uh, I think that is going to increase. Uh, we're going to see a entire ecosystem, or um, you know, how the web drives let, let, let me let me give you an example uh i forgot the name of the professor from stanford uh i think dan posted this interview on charlie rose um about i mean done by charlie rose uh, uh dan do you remember his name the professor Thrun. Uh, i forgot his first name uh, anyway so the, they uh, he has put up a website for anybody out there if you if you actually want to do any kind of uh, course from Stanford University, and it's absolutely free. Um, the well, what, no, 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 okay, finish. I want to talk to this when he's done, because I can tell you from a practical standpoint, from my experience dealing with network television, why this is a big deal. But go ahead, Sri. Right, right. No, I, I'm just trying to combine that with Hangouts. How it, how it is going to? I mean, I know you're talking about Hangouts. So uh, I, I, so far, I've done lot of, in my career, I've done a lot of online interactive educational programs. I've always found that the players, the actual education players are quite clunky, not very intuitive. You have, there are a lot of, uh, you know, such programs out there. So the interesting thing, what I saw, I signed up for a course today and the course was called how to build a search engine. Uh, I shared it out there as well. And then I took like uh, probably an hour or two hours class. There was a lot of interactive examples, uh, quizzes, and you have to write programs in Python, etc. Let me tell you this, the way they have used the YouTube player to do an interactive uh, session of teaching was blew my mind, absolutely blew my mind. I'm like, wow, I, I don't know, Alan, whether you have seen it, you can actually, they have an interface where you can type in the code within YouTube and run it. You don't need an editor. Separated That's interesting. Yeah, I, I'm I'm coding in Pascal, right? I mean, not Pascal. Sorry. Uh, We've had this I, Pascal discussion. Right, I know. In, it's in, in our mind. internal chat here. Right. So I, I'm coding in Python inside the YouTube interface and running it. Imagine the power of that. So suddenly I'm thinking, together with Hangouts, together with you know how how they're going to promote education over this, together with the interactivity of uh, YouTube, like. You know, not just a player, but as a productive, interactive uh, software, you might all of a sudden think, see that there is an entire different visual media ecosystem developing out there, and Hangouts is just a part of it. You know. Uh, okay, okay. And that's that's a good point. And Dan, I I want to tie this into something that Bruce mentioned in chat. Bruce, can you pick up from there with with your thought? Yeah, yeah. I, I mentioned in the chat, you know, that I see Hangouts becoming a little more circular with emphasis on circle. Uh, it's like a neighborhood within a neighborhood. I mean, there, are, you know, the Hangouts are becoming much more prolific. But I, there's a particular Hangout that I spend time in every day. It's called Tech and Coffee, 
And when the Hangout first opens, it opens limited. It we have a it's a Hangouts with Extra. Still got the name, you know, Tech underscore and underscore Coffee. And uh, people can go to techandcoffee.info, click on that link, and join the Hangout anytime. Uh, there may be people in it. There may be nobody there. You may be the first one. But but though it opens up limited, then later on, you know, depending on how many people come in, uh, one of the admins will will give a public invitation, and so we'll get some new people come in. But it's kind of a it's kind of a, a throttle or a choke if you can. Uh, if you can think of it that way. So there's still the idea, you don't want to be, you don't want to have this cloistered uh, monastery type thing, uh, you, you know, where everybody thinks and believes the same way. Uh, and so we continue to have an influx of new people to the point now that if you look at my, my hangouts or my canopy, um, you'll see that tech and coffee is full most of the day. And now we have a, what they call second cup. So, so there's there's a, there's a way to to bring in some of the new people, and then sometimes you get you get some new person that comes in and monopolizes the conversation and and the uh, the neighborhood, you know, the the culture kind of sees, you know, he, you know, he sees he doesn't fit, we see he doesn't fit, but but there's an opportunity to do you, both ends. But I do see Hangouts becoming a little more circular. You you just raised an interesting point there, and it's one that. Uh... We've taken up a lot, and it's something that, that Pam kind of started to address as well, and that's how does Tech and Coffee, or how does any uh, hangout, or how does any social group deal with um, problem people? Well, we now, actually have somebody writing up a document right now for hangout etiquette. It's not complete yet, but we have somebody writing that up right now just to, just to provide some framework. And how do you deal with the person who violates that hangout etiquette? That's a good question. And that I think is is I, I can picture that Eric Rice is going to be joining us any moment now because his ears are buzzing on this subject. Um, but I, I think that's one of the biggest problems. And and Pam, do you want to speak to this? Well, you know, um, I, I personally I don't like it when someone comes into a hangout and starts crap you know for lack of a better word and and it's difficult to get them out of the hangout and they're able to for a minute or 45 seconds or whatever to wreak havoc with with the hangouts and and I don't see that getting any better because the people who Eric has been talking to um, you know at Google are saying that they don't want controls you know I see both sides, organic, okay, but at the same time, you know, there there needs to be some way of moderating a hangout. Yeah, and I, and I think and, it's a difficult balance. I mean, yeah. I just think about the first hangouts that I was in, and would the people there have kicked me out when I first joined, and, and I don't know. I honestly don't know. If Google doesn't develop some type of limited specialized moderation control. There are third-party people out there writing apps right now, even for Facebook Hangouts. And uh, so, you know, I think, I think you know, I, I can understand why they don't want to have moderation, but th I think they're going to have to... Here's, here's what it comes down to for me when it comes to moderation. If they don't put in good, solid moderation, and what they have now is barely useful. It's, 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 you know, better than nothing, but it's barely useful right now. If they don't put in something good in a week or a month or two months, there is going to be a front page article on the Wall Street Journal talking about how there is child porn in Google Plus Hangouts. And Google can't afford that kind of publicity. Final. Uh on this, uh, Bruce, tell me, um, for folks interested in tech and coffee, I guess they can Google that, right? Is there a specific time when it usually starts if folks want to, you know, join Some, that hangout? Somebody or? will usually start it between 8.30, 9 a.m. Eastern time in the morning, and um, and sometimes it will be going on into the evening. In fact, I'm checking right now. So it's sort and, of like uh, open source where anyone can just start it and invite the regulars and et cetera. Right. There are five uh, people participating in the Tech and Coffee Hangout right now. I'm not sure whether it's public or whether it's – it is public right now. So if you have the uh, My Hangouts or Hangout Canopy, 
you'll see Tech and Coffee listed as a public one. So you can join it publicly now. I would have guessed it was a morning affair, but it, <laughs> not sure why. But I guess it, coffee's the second most traded the commodity. Weekend. There's a lot of people who work from home, uh, a lot of it's programmers. It's morning somewhere in the world. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. Okay. So um, I, I wanted to uh, uh, close the Hangout topic by, by just saying my personal experience. My managing editor, Roger Bianchini, from, for Warren County Report, uh, did Fox uh, um, Greta Van Susteren show on Fox News Channel, and uh, which I guess is after I guess it's O'Reilly, Hannity, and then uh, Greta, and um, they sent a uh, they had a re a reporter, they had a, a camera person and someone else, so there were three people, and then I did um, let's see uh, G Good Morning America for example. They uh, they sent an SUV. They had a sound person with the boom mic with the you know feathery thing over my head, um, a producer and a camera guy. And I'm just if you do the math, the expense involved in that, and it ended up being like I don't know 15 20 seconds on Good Morning America, and they spent like two hours with me. So. If you add up the money driving from D.C. Bureau to where I am, you know, an hour and a half or hour, whatever, depending on traffic, um, compared to a Google Hangout, it's a huge, huge, big deal. And the fact that they're mainstreaming it to where it's it's like Skype or whatever, because uh, when, when we all first heard of Hangouts, immediately we're thinking like, well, you know, where will I sit? And and oh, the lighting's bad. I got to get a couple. I got to buy a lamp at Lowe's. Um, I need to put something behind me, uh, that sort of thing. And then it grew from there until these, you know, to these elaborate productions in some cases, like what we do. But uh, it, it's really interesting because as all of these networks and TV stations face cost cutting uh, issues because um, of the economy in general and the, 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 the spreading out of advertising dollars, Hangouts are very attractive because it really is. As Sarah uh, Hill, our my dear friend and our and our a friend of the show, who's been on here a couple times uh, from KOMU in in uh, uh, help me with a state, Missouri, Missouri, um, that uh, she said it's like having you know up to nine satellite trucks for free, uh, you know thank you Larry Page and Sergey so and the shareholders so th that's the thing it's it's um, it's a way. I mean, if you had a breaking story, it just like I remember with um, when the Libya thing blew up and and they on the day that Gaddafi died, I can I looked and I and I found some Libyan folks and I got a young lady who was in Tripoli to go and do a show here on Google Plus. It was a little interview and um, it was just the two of us talking and I got to say to her, you know, are you safe? You know, tell me what's going on. Is it the gunfire on the streets? What's it like to be there in Libya right now as, as the leader of your country has just been killed by his people? Um, you, you, you can't duplicate that. There's no way you can fly out a crew or, or, you know, through conventional methods. I just did it with a simple search on Google Plus for a person in Libya, and I found someone who had enough bandwidth, and she was wonderful. It was fascinating. And you can't duplicate that. So this is this is going to emerge as a continuous, you know, game changer. Um, I think we're going to see more of this. This is just so awesome. Uh, as as a, a broadcaster, a radio guy who does video now, and, and a journalist in general, I can tell you that this is a big, big deal, as Joe Biden might say if you were characterizing it. Um, but anyway, so, um, okay, so uh, what's next? We've got... Um, a very interesting video came up on Charlie Rose with the head of the uh, Google X project, which is the top secret, you know, CIA part of Google. And they talked about the Google uh, Glass and um, the effect on education and things like that. And and uh, one of the things that they told the story of that, that famous ad of the, the blind man who went to Taco Bell in, in one of their driverless cars. 
And now the, the uh, Detroit News is reporting that uh, Google is in talks with automakers about the driverless car concept. Now, Google is not interested, at, at having been burned with their first Google phone, um, they're not interested in actually manufacturing cars because that's not what they do. But uh, they are interested in outfitting cars uh, for the Google uh, driverless car uh, project. And um, right now they're, they're using the, uh, the, the hybrid Toyota uh, Priuses. And, but they're in talks to try to expand this. And the anecdote, I remember uh, from the Charlie Rose interview, he said that this guy used to be able to drive to work in like 25 minutes. And now uh, he was a, 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 you know, had sight. And then he lost it. It was some sort of degenerative condition. And uh, now it, with public transportation, his 25-minute commute became a two-and-a-half-hour commute. And so they thought, wouldn't it be fun if, uh, and, and awesome if they could get him in one of their Google driverless cars? And uh, they got in the car, and they, they taped it at all, and they made a commercial out of it. And he said, let's go to Taco Bell and order some tacos. And the car drove them, you know, around the building and through the drive through and the whole deal. And uh, in the Charlie Rose interview, the thing that got me was he said that there are times when it messes up, right, like an Android phone. But he said you can go thousands of miles before you hit a situation where you've got to grab the wheel and you feel like you've got to take control back from the computer. Um, and this is just in its infancy in a prototype stage. So the whole thing of like cutting down on drunk driving, um, letting blind people, you know, drive, uh, being able to, uh, I think, Alan, you, you, you told me earlier today, you said there was a great post somewhere, and I hope you'll attribute it since I'm borrowing it, where, you know, uh, they've invented, uh, Google's come up with a, a, a product that lets you um, text and email and um, make breakfast and put your mascara on. Uh, it's called the driverless car, and uh, I'm, I'm obviously poorly paraphrasing that, but th th this is fascinating to me, and um, the fact that it might go mainstream in a couple of years, at least on some kind of test basis, right? And it's not going to be a Google car. It's going to be a kit you can get, and maybe it'll be paid for with insurance money or Medicaid or Medicare or whatever uh, for folks in need so that they can... I mean, it might be cheaper than hiring a driver, right? I, I, uh, so, Alan, my, let me start with you because you're the one who, you know, turned me on to this whole thing. But uh, uh, what are your thoughts on this? I've got two thoughts. The first is this is awesome, awesome technology. It really is. I don't think I can – I don't know. I, I, I can't properly express just how cool it is. And if you extrapolate out, you start thinking about scenarios of how you would use a driverless car – you know, would you need, um, would a family need to own two cars? Or could, you know, could you take a car to work and have it drop you off at work and then drive home for the rest of your family to use later and then come pick you up again later? And once you get, you know, once you get to that point, can you say, well, wait a minute, can a family share a car, multiple families share a car? And what does this do to taxi fleets and, and that sort of thing? So... There's the disruptive technology here, too. But I think one of the things you said um, suddenly got me worried. And, and that was, you said, you know, they've driven, it'll be thousands of miles before you need to uh, take the wheel. And my thought is, okay, let's call that 10,000 miles. That's, that's several thousand miles. Let's say it's 10,000 miles every 10,000 or miles or so there's a situation that requires a driver to pay attention. How many miles a day does America drive? But, but if you want to be fair, Alan, um, the, 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 the fair analysis is not 10,000 miles versus 3,000 miles, but it's um, comparing the experience in a driverless car with a, a, a driven car. No, no, no. Um, and I understand. Right? And that's a, that's a good point, is that, you know, uh, does a human make a mistake more or less often than a driverless car would? And that's a, a very good question. And then you compound the question with, if you've got a fleet of all driverless cars, can you have these driverless cars communicating with each other 
to make sure you've got even fewer accidents? And does that increase the, you know, the question though is if we're saying there's going to be a problem every X thousand miles, at what point do you start saying, well, wait a minute, um, is that better or worse than what a human can do? And when a driverless car does do something, I'm going to call it 10,000 miles just for a number. You know, it, it, on the average, every 10,000 miles, how often does that mean a driverless car is going to get into an accident? How often is it going to get into a fatal accident? And when that does happen, what's going to be the perception about it? Are people going to start saying that this is too dangerous, even though it may not be any more dangerous than a human driving the car? And I think that's some things that, that Google and the auto industry need to start thinking about now, and I, I'm sure they have. I, I agree know, with you, and I think I, I'll go to Anthony in one second for your thoughts on this. But I think um, a, a similar thing is like with, with Wikipedia. They say like, oh, there's so many errors. You know, it's 25% wrong or whatever. That's not fair to say unless you say what's the error rate compared to Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, because they, they, I think there was one you know study out that showed that the error rate on Wikipedia was actually about the same or slightly better, you know, but roughly the same as, as Encyclopedia Britannica, which most folks associate with, you know, being a very um, accurate thing. But um, with the crowdsourcing and all that stuff uh, and, and the uh, ability to update it more rapidly than you would with, you know, a five-year-old printed book series. Um, so I, I think that's the way you got to look at it. But, uh, it's, it's a valid point, we, we, and I'll get, let we, me just reply to that quickly before we turn back to Anthony. I think it's a valid point, but I, I think it does get, again, into the perception issue. What are people going to perceive, and what are they going to believe? And I'm, I'm sorry, Anthony, turn it over to you. I just wanted to reply to that quickly. Yeah, I'm going to go to Anthony, uh, but I will say that I'm really glad that Google got burned. This is will be controversial. I'm glad they got burned with... Um, wave and buzz because it's made them a lot more cautious and a lot more like let's pause and think about this on the marketing perspective as they've done other things in the future i think you know every cloud is a silver lining even though these were fantastic products they weren't widely adopted um and so i think that it's affected them in the future and i wonder and i'm going to ask anthony this and i want you to follow you know w with whatever you know you were about to say but as you see, initially we saw in that famous, I don't know if it was a shareholders meeting or some sort of public uh, sentiment from uh, Sergey or Larry from Google talking about the, the, the Google and how they're going to narrow things down and, and focus on their core products. And he said, like, I know that some of you guys who are shareholders are concerned about some of our you know ancillary products like you know driverless cars, and they actually brought that out as a single example in that sentence um, to, to illustrate something that people might be wondering, you know, what in the world are you doing spending money on this? But now with this PR push, people are beginning to think about it in a different way. And it's, I mean, it could be revolutionary, right? I mean, Anthony, what do you think? Well, of course. I mean, especially, especially with driverless cars, you know, some of the other products maybe probably not even near as much. But especially with driverless cars, you know, right now, today, it's not making money. But, you know, in 5, 10, and definitely in 20 years, it could be, you know, making them enormous amounts of money. If, even if they're not, you know, specifically building it, if they're creating, you know, massive amounts of patents and, you know, like look at Motorola. You know, Motorola has all these, you know, fundamental... Um, you know, telephone patents, and, you know, you know, the patents alone could be worth, you know, developing this pr program at a, even a huge loss today, so that in 20 years, you know, if everyone uses Google's technology for, you know, driverless cars, or they get to a point where, um, if you want to make a driverless car, you have to use, you know, Google patents, because, you know, they basically packed in everything that's uh, fundamental to it, like Motorola did with telephones, then um, you're going to make a ton of money on it. 
Yeah, but notice now what's going on with Motorola and cell phones. I mean, I'm, I'm not well, sure right. I mean, it's a big comparison. Right, and I mean, no, but, you, you have companies like Motorola, and you have companies like Kodak, and you have companies... Uh, uh, I think Kodak's a bad example, too. I mean, right, exactly. I mean, you, you got to keep up with the times, obviously, but, uh, you know, uh, all, of, all three of these companies that I just mentioned, you know, had, uh, you know, and continue to, actually, but, you know, had huge patent portfolios that, uh, you know, uh, kept them in business for 20, 30, 40 years, right? So... All right, let, let, let me ask Bruce something real quick, and then Oleg. Um, Bruce, you're in Lynchburg, Virginia, where one of my papers is, and um, Lynchburg has all the charm of a small town and all the crime of a city. You don't have the shopping that you w would hope to have for being a big city, um, but you have all the crime. So it's kind of a weird place that I love. And you have the Texas Inn, which has cheesy westerns, which are just the most awesome thing ever. Um, but and we are uh, number 49 of the Forbes top 50 list of cities to do business in. That's awesome. That's great. Yes. And of course, Virginia, our state, is number one, right? Um, <laughs> the the most business friendly state. Uh, I'm sorry, Oleg, uh, Washington lost this year. Um, but anyway, so let's talk about this. This is fascinating because, I mean, you see on you know channel uh, channel ten channel thirteen WSCT and 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 uh, uh, channel um, I forget the other one seven seven uh, w, WDBJ seven um, you see like uh, you know the drunk drivers and stuff like that and um, lots of disabled folks I mean this is a big deal right this Dude. is like some silly project on one hand I mean why is a search engine that is shuttering projects uh, that are not core to their business, investing in this crazy notion. But well, when you see that accurate. video, when you see that video of that guy who lost his sight and his 20 minute commute turned into a, a two and a half hour ordeal, and you see him being able to go to Taco Bell and order tacos while the cameras are rolling, I mean, it's just one of the most inspirational things I've ever seen. I was like, Thank God that they're that this rich company is willing to spend the money um, to do this. I mean, what are your thoughts? Because I know well, you're I, absolutely. You know, when I, you know, as soon as I saw you post that video, I immediately went to to watch it. Plus one that shared it. Not only was it a, an incredible story, but what I really was impressed with was the passion with which this Google uh, engineer spoke about it. I mean, you could tell he was fully invested in it. I, I didn't see so much, you know, well, how much money can we make from this product? I mean, the guy was all in. And when I think about just yesterday at 2.30 in the morning, a, a driver driving under the influence, a young lady from Bedford, struck and killed two men, two young men in their 30s, not five minutes from where I'm at right now. And you think about the, the, how this technology could totally change that situation. You know, it is a huge story. And, and I, you know, I like the passion with what you shared it. I like the, um, uh, the emotion associated with it. It was amazing. I, I thoroughly loved it. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, the you know, one thing I was going to say was I definitely disagree with Alan and his sentiments on this car thing because, um, it's one of these deals that number one, this car is not out in production right now. So it's silly to say it's going to go so many miles and then what's going to happen. I mean, it's way too early to talk like that anyway. Uh, by the time they release it, I'm sure it's not going to be a few thousand miles. I'm sure it's going to be a totally different story. So it's, it's I'm, right I'm now. I'm not sure why you're sure of that, but okay. I, well, I am. I, I'm sure that they're not going to release something that's going to, you know, go broken a few thousand miles. Number one. Well, remember, Oleg. What, 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 one thing to say: this is a these this is an accessory package for an existing automobile, the and they 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 conceded that there are the issues. Point. But Second what point. they're talking about is that it's an accessory. It's add-ons. Go ahead, Oleg. Oleg sorry. This, this is the, the company point. that's released an Android phone. The second that point can, I was going to make. It crash every five minutes. So it uh, doesn't crash every five minutes. I use it religiously. It doesn't crash every I minutes. use it religiously, and it crashes every five minutes. And mine doesn't. Go ahead. Make your point. You know? And my second point was that, uh, you know, this particular 
uh, car will save unbelievable number of lives because of what Bruce just said also. So you can't just look at it, well, the guy says it may require a driver after so many thousands of miles. You have to look at how many lives would they save by having this kind of technology in the place, and then you compare it to whatever. From okay, the- no, no, Oleg, Oleg, hang on. I, I generally agree with you, and I'm, I'm, not even, I'm not even sure uh, you can characterize it that you disagree with me. My point on this, as it has been in a lot of cases, isn't about the reality. It's about the perception. And let me give you another example. Which is safer, an airplane or a car? The airplane, of course. You and I say, of course. The problem is the public perception after an airplane accident is that the airplane is the most dangerous form of travel. Why yet the reality think, is that it's so that much is? safer than a car, it's not Why fine. do you think that is? You think that it is because of perception. No, but why? Why is the perception like that? The perception Media. is like that because uh, big airplane accidents and big casualties on airplane accidents are heavily reported. And automobile accidents, which happen dozens they, or thousands of times a day, are not reported. I'll I don't even you, think that's necessary. I, I'll tell you exactly what it is, Alan. Is my boss? You'll tell uh, me. Yeah, the, okay, go ahead. The 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 guy that used to uh, I used to work for for many years. He refused to fly airplanes because he said that there's no way you're getting him in the plane. He would not go on vacations. Remember, I worked for a vacation company. We had all these resorts you could go to for free. He would not go take his family because of you know he wouldn't fly an airplane. And the reason he told me why that is, because I told him, statistically, airplanes are far, not just a little bit, but far safer than cars. You know what he said? He says, I have control when I'm in the car, and I usually would die much faster if that was his reason. And so my guess is most people probably have the same feeling he does. You're dying for two, three minutes, and you're thinking and knowing you're going to die versus somebody hitting you, and you, you know, in a lot of cases, dying immediately. That's what was driving him away from the airplanes. That's no, no, what no. Was... You, your comment before, I have control. That's what Listen to what you just said. In a, in a Google car, you're not going to have control. No, no, no. Forget. I'm talking about airplanes. No, no, no. Oleg, that's Let's the point, though. I'm Google making car. a comparison. Let's get back I'm to Google making car. an analogy. Let's get back to Google car. With Google car, what I'm saying is that, A, you know, the thing that Bruce said the, about the couple of people dying there, this is the kind of car that can solve this problem. And that's why it should be taken extremely seriously. And as far I, as the bu- and I agree with you one hundred percent. As far as the bugs, you cannot tell them that they're going to stop or require control every few thousand miles. The car is not even anywhere close to production. Oh, like, all right, let's go to sh- subjects on the All right, no, no, let, let's not. go to let, also, let's go to Sharik, and then let's let let's uh, talk about. Uh, you didn't really make a, 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 you know accurate statement there. By the way, there was something with the plus thing. I couldn't find it, so I apologize for my. Prior comment about the plusing, there is something screwed up. I, we'll go into it. The deal, Dan. One one thing. I think, think you should let him argue. One thing you're not telling the audience here is the fact that this deal with this car, how it started. It didn't start as some glorified project to save the planet. It started out as a Google's way to do something cool to help them map for Google Maps. That's how the whole project started. Okay. And yes, this gentleman that spoke about it is very genuine. And he's totally into it, and it will change lives all over the place if it becomes reality. But they started out as a way to minimize the amount of money and the amount of effort being spent to map all these silly streets we I live around for right. Google. I don't think it's correct, if I have read it correctly. I mean, if I read it right about it. It started as uh, the same professor I told you about from Stanford. He heads the Google X projects, and uh, there was a DAPA project by, I think it was, I don't know, the military or somebody. And, right. and the cash price was a million dollars who actually creates a car which can self-drive. And right. I think, and I think they won it. It, was, it had got nothing to do with maps at that time. But anyway, uh, I don't even understand what you guys are talking about or fighting about. There's no real argument here. It's a great invention. It's the best of its kind. I have uh, no idea what we're fighting about either because it doesn't seem like we are. Let me, let me complete. Google uh, Maps. Whether... They're, they're not. they they are not even talking about commercializing it. Uh, at least in the next. They have. They have talked so about. I, it. I saw that about how they're talking to the Detroit auto companies to, you know. Yes. But you see, you think that you're gonna see a car on the street, which is completely self-driven, 
in another two years. I, I doubt it. I don't know about two years, but maybe in yeah. 10 years, yes. But uh, one point Alan said about uh, you know, uh, Android crashing every five minutes, though the analogy is pretty funny. Um, you know, it, it's like... No, it's the, totally a true statement. I, I agree. I agree. I mean, it's I'm, not untrue. <laughs> no, it's you can't say it's totally untrue. I no. have a phone that so can reliably it. crash every five You're minutes. <laughs> this is, this is about so so you can't tell me I'm wrong because it's my phone. Are you sure it doesn't have an Apple logo on it? This one I'm positive. <laughs> Look, here's the phone. Here's the phone right there. Uh, okay, you can one. even clearly say that it's not made by Apple. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. It does not crash at all. So, you know, so, well, uh, well that is not just true about Android. I, we know that other phones also crash. So, uh, we know so, that other other cars also crash. What's your point here? Absolutely. So, what I'm saying is, <laughs> anyway, the deal with the car also from looking at the information before, because, you know, it's not like news or anything like that for some people, is they did get this car put together for Google Maps. It wasn't the DARPA deal, it was Google Maps. And then, when they got it going and they got using it all over the place to do the mapping, they had one incident, one incident when they had a problem where there was a, a car wreck, but it was caused by the other driver. It was not caused by the <laughs> Google Drive uh, being at fault here. So they had this one situation. See, that, is a, that is a very, very important point. The point you just said, how are you going to react to rogue drivers on the street? It, it's it's not, you're talking about a completely yeah. different topic here, okay? No, no, nobody speaks about well, it. Well, well you, you can't know, complain about you know, any topics the all driver no. this, The driver of this call might be better at avoiding accidents with road drivers. I, I, and I, that's... I that's drive true. In freaking New Jersey. Uh, you see the traffic here? There's, uh, there's no... Are, there's no... That's right. Sarik knows. It, 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 you know, me driving from here to work is 12 miles, okay? And it's like driving in India every single morning. Honking, people cutting people off, and all that stuff. How is Google going to be able to write a program but, to deal with but, all these crazy people? Fab, this is the time of us. Let's talk about this. Let's, wait, uh, let's not wait for the other. What I'm saying is, it is not a uh, Swiss Army knife tool to, you know, okay, I just, I mean, it's not like that movie. I forgot the Will Smith movie where he just gets into the car and say, auto drive, engage. And then he just sits there and the car takes it all the way to his office. That's not going to happen in another 10 years or maybe even before I'm, I'm this out. Is, but This is really why you don't work for Google right there. No, no, I, I'll tell you, it's very difficult for that to happen because the same professor who did this also says that we don't have the artificial intelligence right now for Google Google glasses to look at the table and say, hey, that's orange, that's from Florida. No. So we haven't reached there yet. That kind of image recognition and that kind Shriek, of... no, here's, here's my concern, though. And, and you have a point. Shriek, I know you're a computer programmer. Oleg, I know you're a computer programmer. Yeah. Have you ever, ever written a computer program that once it went live had zero bugs? Few, but but most of them Dep don't. depends on the number of lines. But no, it depends how complicated it is. And I and I think that the the, the key test for this, and we should move on. The key test for this is Google should literally yeah. buy an island, and or or buy a big plot of land and do what they Disney World did, bottom. and they should buy they, they should build a whole development where everywhere I mean every single vehicle is a driverless car, and there are no human powered cars. And you, then you, know, you don't have to worry about the human element because, as Pam said, right. what about the, this, this, this? The only problem you have with driverless cars is the human element. A tractor trailer losing his concentration because he's texting or tweeting and plows oh, into you. Of course, that would never happen about, with the Google Plus. You're talking, about, you're talking about a tractor trailer uh, on auto drive, or you're talking about a Google, uh, I mean, a car with auto drive passing by and the tractor trailer losing its way. I'm talking about something like Ruston, Virginia, which was a concept city or, or development. Uh, I used to live in Deepwood, which was the it's complicated, but it was like the last farm to hold out. So it's called Deepwood, but it was kind of part of Ruston. And it was uh, a planned community where they said, like, OK, we're going to have houses here and we're going to have grocery stores and the DMV. Um, and when they initially plotted out the United States, when it was territories back in the olden days, uh, when Oleg was, you know, just a teenager, um, they they uh, they decided there would be like a, a a post office. You know, they planned where the post offices would be and where the libraries would be and all that stuff. 
um, planning for the future. And, and of course, libraries were just so phenomenally important, uh, and, and thank God they did it. But um, if, if Google actually started a planned community that was all driverless cars, then they could really get 2020 in there and 60 Minutes and all these people that have done, you know, in the way that the, the Xbox or whatever it was called, uh, um, uh, I, I forget the name, the, the Energy Box, um, on uh, 60 Minutes, you know, that story blew up. So it would be so interesting to see that if they could actually plan a community in the same way that they're adopting Kansas City, Missouri um, for their you know, gigabit or gigabyte broadband project. Yeah, but why would why would you do that when you can just get Nevada, which they have, right. to, you know, legalize them in the entire state? Anyway, Dan, I wanted to read a couple of comments from uh, from YouTube, which we had. They, there's been an active discussion there while we've been having this, uh, this car chat. Um, uh, mostly a lot of agreement with, uh, with various things that we've said. Uh, Blackjet84 wanted to know how many miles did that car drive without a crash? It didn't say. His, his remembrance was it's over 100,000 miles. Easily could be, because like I said, um, it was not the street stuff. So. He, he also suggested to me that if my phone crashes every five minutes, that I need to realize that I have an Apple phone. Uh, and I can quite assure him and everyone here, this is an Android phone. That's fine. Trust so me on that point. Which Android phone do you have, by the way? Which phone is it? This is the Samsung, some model that starts with an I that I can never remember because I always want to shout insults at it instead. Um, we had uh, uh, some comments about Flash on Android, and, and I don't really want to yeah, yeah. Which, which version of Android are you running? No. It's currently running 2.2, which is an improvement mm -hmm. over its previous version. Right, right. Yeah, but you, you need to change the phone is what it is. No, I don't. Well, okay. sure. Never mind. We'll get into this one another time. Um, final thoughts here, on the car. Here, the, here's here's the, the final thought on this, and it comes from our YouTube chat, and I really like it. Uh, Chad Lafarge says, my concern with driverless cars is that it has an error every how many miles? If I drive 15,000 miles per year, how many accidents will I have as a result of a blue windshield of death? The BWOD. And with that... Back to you, Dan. Uh, can I add my final thoughts on this? I, it, it, I mean, for an invention or a technology to crash, what's that, 100,000 miles in every whatever? And they haven't given us, it, it, it did not say it's crashed or, you know, they said a bug in 100,000 miles, right? Right, my, the my, bug could be just saying you need to drive because I'm about to crash and, you know, I'm, you know. Yeah, but if I'm asleep, in seconds, so it could but, be you know massive. But, but if I'm in the back seat asleep while my car is driving, you know, or if there's nobody that. in the car, well, that that's what I'm saying. You know, it is how you take it. If if it's all about if I'm driving cross country and Midwest, you know, it's like empty for like miles and miles. It's a perfect invention. If you're if you're thinking about using it in New York City, well, may not be. If it. I'm Hey, then it's even better if we were in planes because you know the planes there is nobody around. You. Anyway, we'll, well we'll pick this up in the after show. Well, well, in planes at least you have the if it malfunctions it's gonna fall down. You don't oh have yeah, to that's that's a lot safer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, but my point is it's a great invention. You're gonna see I, it come through. I will agree it's a great invention, but I think it's going to have a PR problem at the first accident. Oh yeah, I mean every new invention had a PR problem. Tell me one which did not. Now, for men, can you imagine how great this would be? You could program your whole vacation trip, including potty stops. And so if somebody says, I've got to go, and says, sorry, you've got about 30 more minutes left. Uh, okay. You can program your Cracker Barrel stops and <laughs> everything else. Um, I got to tell you, Bruce, I don't know if we're allowed to say potty stops in uh, an on-air hangout. I don't know if that's in the terms of service agreement. <laughs> Actually, Ironically, cool Bruce for, is I like. I don't think mentioned what it would be cool for would be to do hangouts. Because then you can drive and do hangouts at the same time. I was trying to do one today with Dan, but I think you know. I think the, I think what, the what's funny is of this country that we really turned. What, what's, what's funny is Bruce is um, is like the most congenial, wonderful, peaceful, loving, follow the rules guy in the world, and he's the only one who's ever gotten me a violation on my YouTube channel. But you know, I mean, you know, this this talk about the Google Car is interesting in that. 
it seems far out and it's a wacky invention and you gotta wonder where these guys came from and yet this week we also started hearing more and more about uh, Eric Schmidt and Larry Page doing something that's even more far out and wacky yeah. and well, you want to it yeah exactly. yeah I want to talk about that because uh, my interesting take on this is um, Larry Page has has perhaps following Steve Jobs advice to you know cut everything that's the gravy and focus on the meat and the potatoes and, and stick to your core product right and um, he took time off from cutting all of these you know Google Labs and all these different products uh, to go mine asteroids <laughs> for, for precious metals um, and really if you think about it though Google is interested in cell phones and you know the stuff and we're, we're largely captive because most of the rare earth materials um, that are available are in China and we have a you know on again off again relationship that's with that's not quite true that's not quite true there's actually plenty of rare earth resources elsewhere in the world just that most of it right now is coming from China there hasn't been a lot of effort to mine it in the United States right now but there's rare earth is is a technical term it doesn't actually indicate that there's not a lot of it there's there's plenty of this stuff all around the earth we just haven't really tapped into it yet uh, true, it could be a marketing thing because I, I talked to a guy who's in the diamond business and he said that um, there's actually no, lots of funny. diamonds out there. It's yeah, just uh, it's a marketing Google, thing. Google, but le, but Google is, also, Google is also very big into energy. So that's the, you know one of the reasons that yes. he's doing that is because of their energy efforts as well. So so it brings us back to this asteroid thing. This is crazy, um, but awesome. Uh, Google is such an innovator. And now they're going to, uh, without doing any evil, I guess they want to fly uh, to, well, I say Google. I mean, Larry Page and, and um, uh, their former CEO, um, oh, my God, Schmidt. Uh, Eric. Eric Schmidt, are investors in this project. And there was a big uh, uh, live uh, video thing, I think, yesterday or the day before that was really interesting. And they're going to go and fly out with uh, some unmanned uh, spaceships to go to asteroids and mine them for precious metals or, or for whatever they can find, life, you know, <laughs> discovery of life, whatever. Uh, this is kind of out there, isn't it? But it's cool, right? It's totally cool. If you use uh, Alan's line of thinking, you know, if they don't land on this thing, they're not going to get anything. I'm, I'm not sure how I got dragged into this one, but um, yeah, I mean, we have to realize Schmidt and Page are just investors. And, you know, some of their quotes that they have on their investor page, and the, if you haven't checked out planetaryresources.com, go check it out because it's got some, uh, some interesting stuff. And, and this is actually addressing Blackjet84, who just asked the question, where can he learn more? The company is planetaryresources.com. Uh, Schmidt and Page are, are two of the investors. Ross Perot Jr. is one of the investors. Um, some of the advisors on this team include James Cameron, who last we heard was deep at the bottom of the of, uh, of the ocean. Um, we have retired military generals here. We have MIT planetary professors here. Um, we've got you know a, a pretty wide range of people who are are trying to do this and it's a serious effort and it's it's not just for the metals um there is water out there there are all sorts of things and the real question is once you get it and once you bring it back to earth what do you do with it because um, bringing it down to what's earth the name of it alan for folks who, who want to know uh we're going to comment like how do i it's called uh what's the planetary project planetary resources did they actually demonstrate the capability I don't think they've demonstrated with an actual Android, have they? Okay, so we'll we'll, Use we'll dig into this more Use as, as it develops Android. because they're kind of like the details are trickling out on this. But basically, so it's, it's you, awesome. It, go ahead, Pam. Do you and, know and then why? Let's go to... Do you know why that the private enterprise is doing this rather than a country? The the there's a a global treaty that. Um, prohibits any country from late making claims to any space bodies 
but is it space? The is yes, this, but is the space treaty any space bodies? That's not how I yeah, it's it. any okay, any 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 space body. However, there is nothing in that treaty that says that a private um, conglomerate can is is held to the same um, restrictions. So you mean we can't just buy Mars? Correct. Yeah, actually, Sreek, if you wanted, in theory, you can buy real estate on the moon and Mars. The problem with both of the, with the companies that do offer such things is that since countries can't recognize their claims, um, there's a legal limbo in them. Sure. I'm just trying to imagine Simon Fuller, um, who put together the Spice Girls, what kind of act he could come up with for a girl band called the Space Bodies. And I'm thinking that could be a big seller. That could possibly compete with that Dancing with Stars. Thing. I think that I think that title already exists, but I don't think we can show that on YouTube. But on Cam Four, maybe. Um, okay, just kidding. Um, I've only heard that in National Geographic. Okay, so um, all right. So uh, Facebook, our uh, competitor, our friends, Zuckerberg and Company have. Uh, I refer to them as that other social network. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so they have uh, innovated this week. And one of the things that made the news was someone got a screen capture of uh, trending topics on uh, or trending stories or trending posts. I forget what it was. And I think that's the only source we have on it because we looked for it. So it, it may be like a done deal. But I, I went on Facebook or as Oleg would say, Facebook, um, and I checked it out. And uh, so let me go to o who's whose topic was this? Was this Alan or, or Oleg who put this in? I, I added it. OK, but uh, I, I just think can, um, can this is a natural like saying anything about Facebook. Come on. I think this is a natural thing for them uh, for two reasons. One, because Google Plus did it and it's it's popular and uh, it's a great way to get more people engaged in your product. And two. It's interesting to me because. Facebook has always been this sort of incestuous social network among your existing friends and family, and it's very hard to discover new people there as opposed to MySpace or Google before it or Google Plus after it. This is sort of um, alongside of some of like the sponsored stories, but it's really Facebook conceding that they need to go beyond um simply social interaction with your existing click into what Google Plus is strong at, the, a discovery engine to make new friends and family. And I think that's the larger story that's missed in this whole trending topics adoption, potential well, adoption by Facebook. What do you think, here's, Alan? Here's the thing. It's not entirely clear. They use the term trending topics, if I remember correctly. But in the screenshots of it, it wasn't entirely clear that these were trending topics, but more similar to what Google had, was doing with our, their What's Hot list. So it seemed more like these were just kind of stories that were very popular or very well shared or, um, or something like that. So it, was, it seemed closer to the What's Hot list. That said, I do think it sounds like it was Facebook trying to increase discoverability of, uh, of a variety of stories. Uh, anyone else have any thoughts on this? Uh, Pam, did you have something? No. No, yeah. Thanks a lot there. Uh, Sreek, you have any thoughts? Well, as long as, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a very easy um, algorithm to implement, I think. If they're going to just, uh, uh, you know, Twitter has it, Google Plus has it. Uh, I mean, I always wondered why they never had it in the first place. But as Eric Rice would say, it's just a gameable system. And, uh, if, you know, go ahead, Pam. I was just going to say, I think there's the same um, um, potential to, you know, jack the system and get your topics to trend um, hey, but, but on Facebook the as there is on Google+. Plus. But here's the thing, 900 million users. And uh, is it, uh, I don't know, do I see the same trending topics like anybody in Japan? On Google Plus, you do. That is, of course, assuming you seem, see the same trending topics as in another browser window, since trending topics have a couple of bugs with them. Right. We, we've talked about uh, the killer app being Hangouts, but really, the killer app on Google Plus is is what I alluded to earlier um, during you know when I was 
politely interviewed, surprisingly so, by you guys. And uh, the killer app is, is the discovery engine. You can find people who are interested in knitting or amateur radio or entrepreneurship or life coaching or whatever. And uh, things that interest you, you can find people, you know, and, and I'm not interested in all of those or I don't think any of those things. But um, that's the really that's the killer app. And you can say what you want about Zuckerberg, but they they're smart guys uh, and gals and they know what they're doing and they're studying very closely. It's very clear that Google Plus that that team is looking intently at any new innovations that Facebook is up to and vice versa as they should. And I think it was either this post or something close to it. Um, wh what I wrote as a headline on my post was a smart business person, or I think I said businessman for the, to make it easier for the second part of the sentence, but a smart businessman never met a good idea. He didn't steal. And there was some poetic license or dramatic flair to that, but basically they figured mm -hmm. out that that's what Google plus is real. I mean, hangouts, are a big deal and it's their killer app uh, to a degree, but really the fact that you can meet and new interesting people who share your interests and it, as as uh, well, Guy Dan, Kawasaki Dan, said, your passion is what the I, killer app is, and I think that's well, what this is about. When I well, there's two things. One, there's what it, what is it about and what is the killer app. When I say killer app, the killer app is the thing that makes everyone real that makes everyone wonder how they did without you all along. It's the thing. That brings people that brings the attention to your product, and and makes people use it. Facebook, you know, it, it, they say it's all about connecting with your friends and your family, and it's all about you know these relationships. Nonsense. The killer app on Facebook was Farmville. Everyone joined Facebook because of Farmville. And yes, once they were there, they started talking to other people, and they started sharing pictures, and they started doing all of these things. But the reason they went to Facebook was from Farmville. And we know this because Facebook has told us that 13% of their profits come from Zynga. And that's a ridiculously high number. But that's how much money Facebook is making is 13% is essentially on Farmville. Okay. And you can't sneeze at that number. All right, um, our final topic before we go, and I'll start this time on the right side of the Hangout and end up with Alan. Um, our final topic here is Oleg. I am, I'm, I'm drooling to, to see this. Oleg and Priz uh, are going to duke it out over whether Google Plus is more civil. I think this was a, a topic that got cut for time, something we rarely do, obviously, on this show. But uh, last week, um, I don't even remember the original article. I hope one of you two guys do. Oleg, you want to again now? Okay, go ahead, Alan. Do a brief thing, and then let's throw it to Oleg. And then the original uh, article was on ZDNet, shockingly enough, which was titled "Google Plus's Best Feature: The Power to Shut Fools Up." And uh, basically, the whole thing—it's it, actually a really, really good article that talks about how you can uh, mute people, how you can block people, how you can make them disappear in your life, or at least your Google Plus life. And lo and behold, here's Eric Rice to speak on the issue. Oh, thank you, Alan. It's, it's like I summoned you out of thin air or something. Um, anyway, the article is pretty good. One of the good things about this article is that it does go into some details to help people learn how to block and cut people out of your circles. And if you don't want to hear them, what you can do about it. So that was the, the good part of this article. Um, what I thought the, the downside of this article is it didn't really address how people were socially dealing with this technological feature. And I don't think people are really dealing with it well. Right now, what I'm seeing a lot of is instead of blocking a person, what they do is they threaten to block a person. So a comment thread will turn into this stupid debate about, hey, you just said something nasty to me, so I'm going to block you. Why would you block me? Because I can block you. It's, it's an idle thread almost. And I don't know. If you're going to use a tool, just use a tool. Just block them, get it over with, get on with your life, they'll get on with theirs. 
Okay, so um, of course there are no idle threats from Eric. Um, he just straight up blocks your butt, right? Um, no, Mr. Nice Guy. All right, let me. Uh, not, not entirely true, but. <laughs> and I'll, and I'll rare entertain. Uh, what's good is that, that most of the folks he's blocked won't be able to see this. So, um, okay, uh, let me uh, start with Sarik, and let's uh, just do sort of a you know how was your week, and then Pan, get ready, you're going on camera next. Um, Sarik, did you have a great Google Plus week? And what was the most interesting thing you saw um, in, in, in Google's fledgling Can the Muppets Save Us from Obscurity social network? Well, uh, I mean, I was not really too much into Google Plus today. I mean, this, this week I <clears throat> had an extremely busy week, but uh, I was mostly listening in to everybody else, and I think I actually enjoyed it as a listener this time. All right, and uh, that, that was great. I, I love, um, I actually enjoy Sreek's posts, and he posts, I don't know, like anywhere from five to 15 things a day, and, and they can, it's a wide variety of stuff. It can be intricate, complex tech stuff, or it can be really funny, stupid cat pictures or whatever, but I don't think I've seen a post that he's shared with me yet that I didn't enjoy. Um, so uh, you're you're a great member of the team, and I really appreciate you being part of it, um, as is Pam, who uh, I, I frequently engage with, and um, we are uh, far more cordial on the program <laughs> than sometimes we are in real life. But I love you to death, Pam. I mean, in our comments, you know, we're you know we're we're both two passionate people, I guess. Uh, what was the most uh, uh, and, and Pam? All, all these folks, you should circle, please do. Uh, Pam, what was the most uh, interesting or informative or enlightening thing you saw on Google Plus this week? Um, actually, I enjoyed a lot of science posts this week. I, I was I was pleasantly surprised to see a lot of um, uh, biology and health uh, news. In addition, in sorry, in addition to the ones that I um, that I post, um, um, I um, I. I enjoyed learning about the new things going on in health, in the health news and in, in, in the science world and, and stuff like that, um, because I'm not a techie. And um, so um, I did enjoy that. And I, um, you know, just. Posted. What do you mean? You are a techie. You are a, you, your, your area is also technology. You're, you're talking about computer science and general as techie. Yeah, maybe you're not, but. <clears throat> Otherwise, yeah, you are a techie too. I don't think she eats yeah. eats, sleeves, and breathes it like like some folks do. I'm, I I, th I mean, she's she knows her. She's got some game, but I, I don't think she. Uh, or maybe she's yeah, lowering. I, I think she's lowering expectations, Sreek. I, I couldn't code my way out of a paper bag. Let me tell you that I've never coded anything. I don't. You know, I can barely use Access. Yeah, but less. I'm sure. I'm sure most of us here, if we found ourselves in a chemistry lab would do a fairly good job of only one thing, and that's causing harm to ourselves. Um, yeah, you probably shouldn't, you shouldn't do anything in a chemistry lab without uh, some Right, uh, whereas guidance. I think you yeah. would be very, very <laughs> fluent in such a lab, so. All right, I'm gonna go I to would Eric. Definitely know what, I so would definitely know what to leave alone, for All sure. Right. I'm gonna skip Oleg for a second, because Oleg and Alan are last. Uh, Eric, um, what uh, what was the most interesting thing that you saw on Google Plus this week, or whatever? Here we go. Brace yourselves, uh -oh. folks. Actually, um, you know, I don't. You know, it's it's wherever I am first is where I see the interesting thing. So I just want to throw that out there. So I don't see anything interesting on Google Plus. If I happen to be on Google Plus when the news hits about something, then I don't know. It's there. If I happen to have Facebook open when something interesting hits, it shows up there. You know, so I don't really have that. Although, uh, I love playing the trending game. Uh, trending, the word trending was trending on Google+, Plus, which is delightfully meta. But, you know, you throw trending topics right up there. It's a freaking tease for everybody to just go, oh, what can we do with that? Um one of the, because I love studying the psychology and the sociology of it all. One thing was My Little Pony trended. And the reason that My Little Pony was even there in the first place was because a bunch of people decided they wanted to get Kim Kardashian off the trending topics list. 
So they didn't get her off the list, but they successfully made the kids show My Little Pony to trend. But then all the fans, and there's a weird adult sub, uh, you know, following subculture, and they were like, oh my God, My Little Pony is trending. Of course, everybody's clicking on it. And then stage three of this is now everybody who's complaining going, why is My Little Pony trending? And, you know, you look at these things in little instances and look at those goofy trending topics or look at the serious ones and then go digging and watch their evolution. You can, you can learn a lot from it. So, but nothing terribly interesting. I just have uh, been paying a lot of attention to people who are broadcasting, want to broadcast, trying to keep uh, the feet, uh, Google's feet in the fire on, on pub, you know, getting people set up on things like YouTube live and on air and, uh, helping people out who are trying to, uh, get, get shows out there. Cause there's lots of distrust of Google. There's lots of resentment between power users and, uh, Google's, uh, they're out to lunch. They don't get it. They send guys in, they send engineers in to figure out social problems and it's not working and people are getting, you know, kind of fed up with it, but you know, there more people are becoming aware of video. So it makes it easier for people to skate between sites and services. So more so power to the content producer, forget the platform. We, we need to celebrate the content people. Eric, do you think that they should have like psychologists or sociologists working for Google then maybe to moderate some of this stuff? No, they should have, well, first of all, the tool should be available to the users. Uh, they're so engineer heavy. They need to back off on some of the engineers and have people that use the product. In fact, most of the trusted Googlers, most of the people that are really looked up to are ones that exist with the product who don't actually have a responsibility to the product. A random tech support guy here, a random data center. Those are the guys that we really feel can understand it. Usually they agree with it. But there's, um, there's just so many engineers. It's like, is there a product manager? And I was trying to figure this out and it's like, well, there's a VP and there's lots of engineers. Who is the product person that understands? The product person has to be squarely positioned between an engineering department and the you know, in the business department and understands users. An engineer is not necessarily cut out to understand the fuzziness of, you know, uh, an engineer cannot, I don't think, and I mean, I don't mean disrespect because Google has some of the smartest engineers out there. Um, the, I don't think they have that kind of abstract realization of the fuzziness. They say organic, but I don't think they really get organic. They're like, but linearly in code and dependent, and you know, there's this logic and there's this math to their, their craft and that's great. But at some point you need that human element. Oh, I would, I think all social media in general needs more sociologists in this just because you've used Twitter for 3,700 hours a day does not suddenly make you a, a social media consultant, but Hey, if you got a book, then who am I to talk? Cause I don't. Okay, but really, well, you replicate that a lot. And so, no, they don't necessarily need sociologists or psychologists, but get a product guy out there, a product okay, person. You know? What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to – I'll continue down the line, and then um, we'll con conclude the formal show, which gets uploaded you know, to YouTube and stuff. And then I'm we're going to continue Dan. the YouTube. No, no, you're cool. <laughs> uh, you're, you're wound up. You're ready to go. So what we'll do is uh, I'm going to end uh, – I got you know uh, four more people to talk to, and then um, – We'll end the formal show, but the live thing will continue, and uh, it'll still be available on on uh, the YouTube, the other YouTube channel. It, it's very complicated, you know, all the different places you can find the content. But um, uh, uh, so so hang out, and and those of you who are watching live on YouTube, or or Justin, you this will continue uh, in in just a moment. Uh, Bruce, uh, you're you're one of my favorite people in the world. I, I love you to death. You're uh, just a, a great guy. And I respect you so much, as all of us do. Um, so uh, I'm just curious, what was your now? Now I've laid all this anticipation <laughs> here. You know, I've not successfully lowered expectations. Um, what What was the most interesting, or fascinating, or just fun thing that happened to you on, or you saw on Google Plus this week? Well, there would be two things. First, I would quickly mention the Blue Temple hair treatment on Eric Rice. Lovely touch. I like that, Eric. The second oh, the whole thing, head. <laughs> the second thing was uh, was the uh, was a flight uh, uh, by Google uh, by Glenn, um, one of the guys that hangs out in, in in Tech and Coffee. He attached his HTC Inspire phone to his radio controlled airplane. 
joined the hangout. We were all there. The plane takes off, flies over this airspace in Kentucky, hills, mountainsides, and forests, flies over a river, and we're all in here engaging and talking. There's a there's a video on on uh, Google Plus that I shared, but that was really interesting. And uh, and when the plane landed, he caught it, and uh, Glenn was on camera. So that was quite an interesting thing. And that was the second flight of what we call in air Google That's Hangout, cool. not on air, but in air, literally. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And uh, Anthony Clauser, uh, anything the, really stuck stuck out to you th uh, on Google Plus week or, or Google Plus this week? I think um, perhaps the most interesting thing that I saw is that um, a whole bunch of NFL draft picks are or did or whatever um, are going to do hangouts. And, you know, just in general, I think whenever someone, you know, from a different segment, whether it be, you know, uh, uh, news shows or, you know, uh, 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 um, well, anyways, whenever a new segment starts using a Hangout, I think that's very cool because you pull in that um, segment's audience to Google Plus and you potentially get um, more interesting, um, you know, people to, you know, to be members of Google, Google Plus and, uh, you know, you get in this case, obviously, you're going to get an influx of um, sports fans that might stay around and, uh, um, you know, add to the Google um, community. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, all of us are friends because of Google Plus. I mean, you, you can't underestimate it. Um, all right. Oleg, uh, Alan is, is in all caps asked for the last word. So he gets the last word this time. But I want to tell you, um, it was your idea to interview me at the beginning. And I thought, like, what the heck is he talking about? Nobody's going to be interested in this. But apparently people liked it. And so um, and, and you were uh, kind that it was interesting. Um, so thank you for that idea. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that folks enjoyed it. Uh, it was interesting to, to have to think back to things that I hadn't thought about for a while. Uh, but it, it, it's always a pleasure. I love you guys. I love all of you guys to death. And uh, I'm so honored and proud that I got to meet you guys uh, through this and that we're all friends now. I mean, everyone in here, I consider a personal friend now uh, because of this wonderful service uh, that we call Google Plus. So uh, what are your what are your final thoughts on, on our official broadcast? And we'll continue with the Hangout for those of you who wish to stay. And, and, and those watching on Justin and YouTube um, will continue afterward, you know, for some of these folks. And then I'm going to open it up to everybody. Um, but uh, what are your what are your final thoughts uh, on this wonderful Google Plus week we've had? Well, it was great to duke it out with Alan. That was wonderful. We concluded uh, that uh, you know you definitely have ADD because of many different things that happened today. And uh, my pleasure in terms of uh, the topic. But uh, yeah, the biggest thing in Google Plus was the Google Drive. I mean, to me that was the biggest thing this week. Everything else is uh, pretty much the same deal. Uh, respectfully, I disagree with Eric on a lot of things negative towards Google. Uh, some of these concerns are true, but at the same time, it's not anywhere near as bad as I think Eric makes it out sound to be, mostly because you know what they're doing, we don't know. And we can see that they're doing stuff because new things are coming out, like Google Drive. And that's not something you can do in one day or by one person. And uh, you know, if the thing was as bad as uh, some of the naysayers say, then nobody would be using it. But a lot of people are using it, and uh, a lot of people are liking it. So that's my feeling. All right. I, I expect there will be a response, which we will uh, wait for the after party for. Um, but Oleg, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And uh, uh, so we're just moments away from the after party. Uh, Alan? Again, I appreciated your questions tonight. It, it was interesting because Oleg threw this on us at the last minute. And said, "Why don't you be the featured guest, Dan?" I was like, "What are you talking about? Who cares about, you know, you know that?" I'm, is, I'm an interviewer. It's, it's it's awkward for me to be the interviewee. So, but anyway, I, 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 I remember when uh, when we had Sarah Hill on, you warned her ahead of time. You said, uh, "You know, I'm going to be the interviewer. You're going to be the one I'm interviewing. So you better be ready." And, uh, you know, we've had a couple of occasions in the past when we've had the interviewee turn around on you and ask you a couple of questions. But, you know, and, and it's been this sort of thing where I figured one of these days when we had an incredibly slow news week, uh, we would corral you into asking questions. But I think Oleg found the, the exact right time to turn it around on you. 
and uh, it's it's really refreshing. Um, I guess I want to end with three things, and there there are three quick things. Uh, one is um, for for me on Google Plus this week, I made a huge huge faux pas. I uh, I shared a post that was appropriate for me to to share, um, using it as an example of something on Google Plus, and the person whose post I shared took it the a way that I completely did, didn't intend. Um, so I've, I've extended my apologies to Krista Ray uh, on Google+, and I'm going to, to take the opportunity here to say it again, that I, I very much apologize for uh, a post that I made that mischaracterized her, it mischaracterized what she does on Google+, and it mischaracterized the post. She is a, a wonderful person. I'm glad to have her as a friend in Google+. Um, and if you are not following her, you should do so. And uh, it will be you and a few thousand other people because she made the suggested user list this, this week as well, which was not what I was talking about at the time. But uh, she is certainly one of those people who uh, deserves it in a good way and not in the sort of way that you would wish the suggested user list on your worst enemy. Um, that was item one. Item two is something uh, that we got in our YouTube comments. Uh, Steve Everett online says, Google Plus is really getting its legs now. The ability to watch and comment on live Hangouts is a big step forward. And I, I agree with that. I think, you know, as Eric likes to put it, it's not the technology, it's, it's not the implementation, it's the video. It's how people use it, it's what it is, and I think this is a great way that people are using it. And finally, we had a comment from Inspector earlier this evening. Uh, when, when he signed off, and I'm going to use it as, as my sign off as well, um, got to go. In parting, let me just agree, Dan, yes, you definitely got game. <laughs> well, thank you so very much, Alan. I appreciate it, and I consider you, along with the rest of the panel and so many others, a, a, a true friend. Um, this was a, a, a interesting experience for me. I think Linda Laurie um, kind of quizzed me a bit because I got her on the show and she's uh, a big star of Google Plus and she said she'd do it on the condition that she got to ask me some questions and so I said okay uh, so I don't understand what all the fuss is about I guess because when, when you see someone in the role of uh, questioning others when you see someone who is so inquisitive of others and so uh not accustomed to talking about themselves, then it, it, you sort of have a self, you know, uh, you develop a mystery about that. So um, if we've called some of that, then good. And if some of the folks found that interesting, then that's, I don't understand it, but if, if it, you know, help with the ratings, then so be it. So it was fun. Um, but I want to thank the whole panel. I really appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. And uh, we're going to continue with the Hangout on YouTube and um, on Justin TV. And uh, so this is an incentive to if you like what you see, then, you know, watch us live because you'll get uh, a lot of before and after bonus stuff. And we're not quite as formal as we are on the official broadcast, uh, but we still can't, you know, use naughty words as much as, you know, Alan. Because and Bruce we're would also like to formal so. on the normal broadcast. Yes, exactly. I know Bruce is just, you know, like a sailor in a, you know. Bra uh, just kidding. I'm <laughs> just picking on Bruce. Um, I love picking on Bruce. And by Bruce, me, he means me. He, Bruce is like the best example you could ever imagine. But anyway, uh, thanks so much. Bruce, for Bruce has the voice, and Eric now has the hair. Indeed. Yeah, Eric is without hat. He's, he's just got his hair dead. Um, but anyway, I want to thank you so much for watching, and uh, we will continue with a live broadcast. But uh, as for the official broadcast uh i want to thank all of you and uh, wish you all a very very uh wonderful google plus week